good morning and welcome to the Board of Education's third FY 2023 operating budget work session. Before we begin, I'd like to address the recent act of violence that took place on Friday at Magruder High School. Words are not enough to convey our sympathy during this difficult time. Our hearts go out to the injured student, his family, and all the students who were affected by this tragedy. We will continue to support the Magruder High School community, and we stand in solidarity with them today. This morning, I had the opportunity to be with the Magruder community and see the emotional support being given, speak with staff, including those who work so diligently to prevent this tragedy. I have to tell you, I did put down some points, but that was a lot this morning. I mean, I didn't really expect to get emotional about it, but I did. To see the overwhelming response from the community that came out to support these kids, you had to be there to see it. I mean, the auditorium was almost full of people who were there to support. And to see the heroes in that school who helped save a life, on, it, it, it really was emotional. I, I, you have to forgive me. But uh, the nurse, Megan, she is a hero. Mr. Nelson, the security assistant there, and everybody in that school. I, it, it's just unbelievable. But our students deserve to feel safe and protected in our school buildings. This morning, I think they did feel safe. In fact, I think there was an overwhelming sense of feeling safe there because of the police presence. And to this end, the board is committing, committed to partnering with our local, state, and federal leaders to ensure that we keep weapons out of our schools and keep our children safe. I'm still overwhelmed by it. You have to forgive me. Today, we will continue the review of the interim superintendent's 2023 operating budget request. The order of review is reflected in the agenda, and staff will continue to provide a review of the interim superintendent's recommended operating budget by chapter. This was supposed to be our final work session. However, we would like to continue our work in conversation on the budget, so we have added an additional work session on Tuesday, February the 14th, 2022. If an additional budget hearing becomes necessary, we will hold that on February 22nd, 2022 at 6 p.m. The board is scheduled to take tentative action on the operating budget at our meeting on February the 24th. As we go through today's budget chapters, I urge staff to point out pertinent issues that may be of concern to the board. As always, board members are free to ask questions at any point during the presentations and request staff to provide information on specific issues. At this time, I'll ask my board members to introduce themselves, starting with Dr. Daca. Good morning. Thank you for, well, thank you for working with us as usual. Ms. Harris. Good morning, everyone. Ms. Mandrowski. Good morning. Ms. Silvestri. Good morning. Ms. Evans. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Board um, President Wolf, for going to Magruder and being there along with Dr. McKnight supporting our community. We all stand with you. Thank you. Dr. Joftis. Good morning. Looney. Good morning. And we're joined by Interim Superintendent Dr. McKnight. Dr. McKnight, do you have any comments at this time? Yes, I just want to open up to say thank you again for the comments you made. President Wolf, um, our community has truly come together to wrap our arms around Magruder High School as we should. And I just want to publicly thank everyone who have contributed to helping that staff, the students, that entire community work through a very difficult challenge. Um, I'm reminded often of how strong our community is when tragedy does face us. And that is absolutely an example of what we are seeing happening at Magruder uh, yesterday, today, and for as uh, much time as they need that support. 
So I just want to thank the board as well for being there and being supportive. And I see the collective support from Magruder High School today in our um, wearing the school colors. And I just want to point that out that, you know, we there, there's no tragedy that faces one of us. It's always all of us. And so I just want to thank the board as well for your support um, to the school and to the community, as I know everyone's seeking ways to help. And we just want to show our appreciation for that. Okay. At this time, I'm going to ask for an approval of the revised agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Dr. McKnight, do you want to begin? Yes. Good morning, President Wolf and members of the Board of Education. This morning, we are going to resume with you the review of the Montgomery County Public Schools operating budget and the resources recommended for fiscal year 2023. Uh, we are excited that we are able to add in an additional work session. As I shared the last time, there are a number of areas that we want to continue to talk about, uh, areas that we want to consider based on the hearings that we hear, um, and that will give us an opportunity to work through those uh, areas to also um, come back and, and talk about some adjustments that we may possibly want to make as it speaks to many of those priorities. In our first work session, we reviewed Chapter 1, Schools, which represents the instructional resources that are put in place for our 209 schools. In our second work session, we reviewed various offices that support teaching and learning um, for our 159,000 students that we serve. And we talked about a number of programmatic things that um, stand out to show what that support looks like and how it is administered to the staff and students. Today, we're going to review the proposed budgets for the offices of strategic initiatives and district-wide services and supports, technology support, and infrastructure operations, finance, human capital management, and conclude with administration oversight. In our first two work sessions and during the two public hearings that we've already held, board members have asked excellent questions, um, and many have been answered for those who needed additional research. And as I said, many questions have been answered, but I think we also want to take some time to really think through and say, what do we need that may not be represented here? I mean, quite frankly, we just experienced a tragedy in our school system on Friday. Every day it comes back and said, based on a number of incidents, is there anything else that we need that we want to put into our foundation moving forward? So I look forward to us doing that. Um, and with no further ado, we can go ahead and get started. I'll turn it over to Dr. Dawson. Thank you, Dr. Quinn. Good morning, board members. And uh, may we have the next slide, please? Dr. McKnight just walked us through what we'll be doing today and what we're looking at in terms of our chapters. So we will go ahead and get started and I will turn the presentation over to Mrs. Dana Edwards, Chief of District-Wide Services and Supports for Chapter 6. Good morning, good morning to President Wolf, Vice President Silvestri, as well as the other members of the board and Dr. McKnight. I'm Dana Edwards, Chief of District-Wide Services and Supports, and I will begin today with Chapter 6, which is co-shared um, District-Wide Services and Supports, co-shares this chapter with the Office of Strategic Initiatives. If we go to the next slide, please. Thank you. The Office of District-Wide Services and Supports is a newly established office. The work of the office is to coordinate the operations, internal and external fiscal and human resources and services associated with the district strategic plan, as well as to coordinate supports around out of school time, as well as other partnerships for our most poverty impacted schools. In the Office of District-Wide Services, we have four separate areas the Department of Labor Relations, the Partnerships Unit, Student Welfare and Compliance, and Out of School Time. These are our four distinct bodies of work, and our work impacts every student, staff, and family member in multiple ways. Our budget is $2.15 million, with $2, point, uh, with $2 million of that being for salaries and wages for 16 staff members. For our four distinct bodies of work, the Department of Labor Relations collaborates with all three employee associations to support the instructional program and operational functions of the district through the agreements um, that we set forth with our um, employee associations. This does help support the manager's ability to run their work site, as well as to provide economic supports to students, I mean to employees as well as students. Recently, we reached an agreement about an increase in substitute pay, permanent substitutes for schools most impacted by staff absences, and operational impact 
pay for those substitutes as well. And we work collectively to be able to problem solve. We do support the implementation of the Maryland Blueprint by working with the associations through implementation for structures throughout the district. And we also in, um, include collaboration structures within all of our associations. The staff and the office work directly with to be able to support. If you go to the next slide, there are about $30,000 in cost under the Department of Labor Relations in order to support professional development for members of that team and for, to have retired supervisors lead grievance hearings for dues and registration. Our partnerships unit is a critical part of the work that we do as they work to identify local, national, and international partnerships to serve as a source of equity to support the success of MCPS's student, staff, families, programs, and priorities. The partners, um, partnerships can take the form of donations, programs, or volunteers. This year, they've done a tremendous job in order to support out-of-school time programming and helping us to secure almost 40 brand new partnerships that are virtual, in-person for our students as well, that relay any way between um, students being able to do um, farming at one of, um, at a site um, within, this, uh, within the city of Clarksburg, as well as to look at STEM programming for our students, as well as for acting opportunities with the Roundhouse Theater. Currently, we have 143 active partnerships 87 are existing partnerships, and I've shared earlier that we brought on new partnerships this year. Each time we look at a partnership, we think through the lens of the board's strategic priorities, as well as through the lens of our district uh, strategic plan in order to be able to support the needs of our students, staff, and families. The third area under district-wide services and support would be our student welfare and compliance unit. Similar to labor relations, except for the focus for this particular unit is really on student welfare. And our work is in tandem with the Office of Teaching, Learning, and School, the schools, the Office of General Counsel, and it's all related to Title IX. This office works on our compliance modules that our staff takes every year and making sure that that platform is really aligned to Title IX expectations and the employee code of conduct our work with uh, the Department of Compliance and Investigations, as well as um, with Child Protective Services to be able to support, support, support reporting and steps with child abuse and neglect. And then this summer, all of our administrators um, were trained in the new bullying, hate bias protocols and sexual harassment revisions associated with Title IX. We also have town hall meetings in December to talk about let's talk um, consent with the assistant state's attorney to prepare students and families in case of needs that they would have going into the holiday. And then finally for this year, we have focused on out of school time. That is the fourth leg of the work in the Office of District-wide Services and, and Supports. And it's been more of a pilot this year that has grown and grown and grown. It's the best pilot ever, um, as I have said. <laughs> and um, the work that we've done has really been undergirded by ESSER funds for this particular year. Throughout the year, we've done some different things and not only looking at our after school activities, but what's been new for this office is really looking at our professional days and our early release days. So yesterday was an out of school time day where students were able to engage not only with the Montgomery County Department of Recreation, we also had opportunities at our libraries, we had student service learning hours, as well as the soccer plex. We are working with partners um, to be able to um, expand offerings in the spring as well as the summer and look at how we offer um, programming after summer school so that when the academic day is over and for students who still need to be in a structured setting or parents who need places for their children to go, they will be able to have that um, opportunity. Um, we will return to the board at the end of February with a more detailed presentation around out of school time and the work that we've done with a multi-stakeholder group 
to really reimagine the, the promises for next year, but also to be able to share our learnings for this year, as well as the impact that we have had. And most recently, um, at our last board meeting, we did discuss our partnership with the Children's Opportunity Fund, as well as the Black and Brown Coalition, in order to be able to offer the opportunity for equity hubs for our students who are within our schools that shift into virtual instruction. And to date, we have about 75 students who are in equity hubs, which is really a powerful piece. And we were able to get them um, in very, very quickly, actually on the first day that we moved into virtual instruction. And so we want to continue that work, but also scale it to really think about continuing it and thinking about it more as a long-term component from the academic perspective. Chapter six for Office of District-Wide Services and Supports, we are offering a same services budget similar to our other chapters for the coming year, but wanted to provide you a perspective of our work um, and um, how our current funds are being um, expended uh, for this particular year as well as next year. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. McKnight, President Wolf, Vice President Silvestri, and members of the Board of Education. I am the second half of Chapter 6, which is the Office of Strategic Initiatives. My name is Stephanie Sharon, Chief of Strategic Initiatives. If we could go to the next slide, please. So the Office of Strategic Initiatives is a new office this year, and our role is to coordinate innovation and equity across Montgomery County Public Schools that links the mission, vision, and core values with the district's strategic plan. My office supervises both the Equity Initiatives Unit and the Office of Technology and Innovation. The work of, of the Office of Technology and, Inno and Innovation will be discussed in Chapter 7. Strategic Initiatives collaborates with all offices, stakeholders, and community partners to identify, launch, and support research-based programs and initiatives that reflect innovative thinking, equity, and excellence. I'd like to give some examples of what that means in practice. This summer, as the district planned to start the year with in-person learning, we knew that we would need a virtual option for students whose health conditions meant that in-person school may not be feasible. Although the work of the Virtual Academy started in the spring of 2021, prior to the creation of this office, the Office of Strategic Initiatives took the lead in supporting and developing the Virtual Academy throughout the summer and the school year. Our office collaborated with a variety of members in the Office of Technology and the Office of Teaching, Learning, and Schools to create a dynamic program for over 3,000 students. Our office also led the development of the board's 2022 to 2025 strategic plan, as well as coordinates the work of the district strategic initiatives implementation plan. We worked in collaboration with the board strategic planning committee, all MCPS offices and our stakeholders in order to launch this work. Now that the strategic plan has been approved, our office is responsible for overseeing the implementation and monitoring of the objectives and strategies through the lens of equity. At last week's budget hearing, there were many questions about equity and the anti-racist system audit. The Office of Strategic Initiatives is the lead on the audit. The audit is a comprehensive, as a reminder, district-wide review of our practices and policies. It looks at six areas, workforce diversity analysis, working conditions, pre-K curriculum review, equity and achievement framework progress, community relations and engagement, and the evaluation of school cultures. Our office is working with our consultant, the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium. We oversee the multi-stakeholder steering committee that helps guide this work, and we engage with stakeholder groups to get input and collaboration on communication as we continue to collect our data. As I stated, we are currently in the data collection phase, and we will have a report that moves us to action by June. In the meantime, our office is coordinating a cross-office team to develop the structures needed to address the issues that come out of the audit. This work is going to inform every aspect of the strategic plan and work with all departments and schools. Indeed, the work of equity is all of our responsibility. We are not, however, waiting for the anti-racist audit to work on these issues. The Equity Initiatives Unit 
which also falls under the supervision of this office, works to build culturally, cultural proficiency and interrupt inequitable policies and practices that disproportionately impact the academic and social emotional success of students of color throughout the district. Several speakers last week when we were in the hearing asked how equity was impacting decision making. The equity initiatives unit has created our evidence of equity questions that leaders throughout the district are now using when making decisions and developing practices. Other examples of our equity initiatives unit's work includes the following. We developed a module called Bridge from Implicit Bias to Anti-Racism that was mandatory for all 10-month employees last summer. Additionally, Equity specialists are assigned and collaborate with OTLS directors and specialists to su support school improvement in all schools. There is a specific team from the equity unit that is assigned to each OTLS associate superintendent to engage in this work. The equity team publishes a monthly newsletter that goes to all staff called Equity Matters to provide tools and resources the team has created special topic issues, such as resources called LGBTQ and MCPS that provide resources to help staff better understand LGBTQ students. An educator's guide to this moment was another publication that was produced after the George Floyd murder. And addressing anti-Asian hate and bias that was developed with community partners as anti-Asian hate and bias incidents were rising last spring. The equity team also leads the Equity Matters Dialogue in the evenings that gives staff from across the district the opportunity to learn and discuss equity issues and strategies to bring into their practice. The unit also organizes study circle dialogues that help students, staff, and parents build the relationships, skills, and structures to address structural racism in schools and offices. Schools also collaborated with OHRD and is continuing to do so to create an on online module on bias in the workplace for hiring managers and interview teams. This work is currently being expanded. The equity team also delivers ethnic groups in American society and education that is multicultural. These are two mandatory training that are required for all professional staff within five years of employment. And then lastly, the unit is integral in the rollout of our anti-racist system audit and the subsequent development and support of our action planning process moving forward. These are just some of, the some of the work that this team engages in. Next slide, please. Now that I've given you an overview of the work of the Office of Strategic Initiatives, I'd like to explain the budget in a little bit more detail. As you can see from this budget that our work, our budget is prim primarily staff. The um, $1,635,000 that is dedicated for salaries consists of staff in my office and the Equity Initiatives Unit. Additionally, our salaries budget includes uh, about $144,000 in the unit for substitutes, stipends, and temporary part-time position. These funds are used primarily for training purposes. For example, when Einstein and Sherwood High Schools participated in a study circle together over multiple sessions, the participating teachers had substitutes that we covered for out of those funds so they could participate as their classes were being covered. We also use the stipend funds to pay for the teachers that participate in the equity certificate program that we are in partnership with McDaniel College with. We also have contractual services built into our budget of roughly 160,000. And this is used by the equity initiatives unit when we need to rent space for training, find expert speakers, registration for professional learning. For example, um, we had to use the Universities of Shady Grove uh, a few years ago for larger training sessions when MCPS space was unavailable. That was pre-pandemic. Uh, we hope that as we're moving forward, we will to be able to have more in-person training um, while we continue to utilize Zoom as a platform as well. Um, we also have our budget, as you can see, for supplies and materials for both um, strategic initiatives and the equity unit. Um, these funds also go to materials and books that support professional learning for staff across the district. Uh, we have an account with Sora, which is an online library that allows staff to borrow books at any time to support their equity learning. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Wolf and the Board of Education for questions. 
Thank you, Ms. Sharon, and I, I'm sure you already know the question that I have for you. You know, we've been doing these equity modules with staff for years in the equity training. What is your indicator of success? So that's a great question. So that is something that we're working on um, building out in more detail as far as how we were more effectively evaluating our work around equity in the district. And this is really where the anti-racist system audit is going to come into play. As you know, the anti-racist system audit is going to allow us to have an evaluation of our practices, policies, et cetera. And it's gonna be used as a, not a starting point because we've started our equity work, but an evaluation point where we can now say, based on this information, how are we moving forward and able to see what we have identified as areas and issues in practice in the classroom? And that is gonna be something that we're gonna be continuing to build out as we move forward. Okay, because I've just never understood. I, I, we take this training you know, every year and I, I'm not sure that it's doing any good. I don't know how you can tell whether it's doing any good. But I do have another question because you said that you had paid for subs for the teachers at Einstein and Sherwood. So when you did those study circles behind the incidents they had, were they students and staff or just the, stu just the staff? Oh no, they were, they were students and staff that participated in those study circles and they were over a series of, I believe three to five sessions that they worked collaboratively with the two schools. Then they also had follow up with the staff separately as a result of the information that they gathered from the study circles. The only reason I ask is because they had subsequent incidents. Now I don't know that the same students were involved, but I'm just wondering about the measure of success of those if the same students were involved or even the ability to scale up from that kind of thing, the teachers being able to, to share what they've learned and, and impact what's going on because something is not happening there. Absolutely, uh, Ms. Wolf, and, and in response to that, actually, we've been working very closely with um, Ms. Rubin and OTLS, because you, you are correct that we've had continued issues there. And what we're actually doing collaboratively between our two offices moving forward as a result of that incident and subsequent incidents that have not only occurred between Sherwin and Einstein, but that we do see continuously occur. We see issues of hate bias and racism occur across the district. So one of the things that we're doing that we, that we want the audit to support, but we're starting it now, is we are working collaboratively with OTLS to dissect our, pro our process when, we engage, when these is issues and incidents happen from an equity lens to determine what works in our process, what are we missing in our process, and how can we work together to make sure that we're not just addressing issues from you know, the lens of a consequence, et cetera, but actually creating opportunities to heal in a community. So we're working collaboratively on getting a team of people together to start really taking a critical eye on how we're addressing that work. Well, thank you. I just hope you're collecting data to see if we have repeat offenders, because again, I'm going to say the policy, I think, needs to be examined in terms of, you know, how many um, sort of times do you get to do this before you, some real discipline is taken. Um, I'm going to go to Dr. Daka, and do you have questions? It, it, why don't you turn your light on if you have questions? Unless everybody can't get it on at the same time, I'll come down to this side. No, I was, I was glad to see that ethnic groups in American society is still being taught. I do regret that the African-American culture course is not required anymore. Uh, I think that's an issue, as well as Hispanic culture. I don't know whether we're still doing that or not, but study circles is good, but if you, more people need to be involved in the study circles in those two schools, uh, particularly. And then we have the other schools where they're using the N-word, so it's, it's all over the district. Ms. Harris. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you want to? Did you want to respond? Or no. I thank you, Dr. Daka. Okay, thank you, Ms. Harris. Yes, thanks. Um, I have a couple of quick questions. Uh, first, uh, Ms. Edwards, I think the first two are for you. Uh, and one is about the partnerships that you mentioned, and this is just for my own information. When you you talked about 143 active and 87 existing partnerships, do we count the? Um, MOUs and partnerships 
for our CTE programs in in that that enumeration. For instance, the clinical partnerships for our um, students in the health professions programs and some of the clinical partner, or I guess they're not clinical, but professional partners that work with, for instance, our cybersecurity students. We do, so I will say that we count our partnerships with our colleges for some of our student teachers, but I do want to go back and look at our CT programs. We work very closely with OSIP um, because of the partnerships that they have already established, as well as newer ones that we get in, but the CTE ones are ones that I definitely want to go back and be able to provide you an accurate response about. Okay, thank you. And then um, next question, you mentioned that currently, Currently, we have 75 students um, working in equity hubs, Correct. and I just want to clarify, those are 75 students from the 16 schools that have currently temporarily pivoted to virtual. That is correct, yes. And in one of the schools, um, and, and we're experiencing this, similar to how our students have to quarantine, sometimes some of our child care centers will have to quarantine or close down, and their regulations are a little bit, uh, a lot stiffer than ours because those are, that's a population that's unvaccinated. I do want to thank our transportation partners who were able to take 12 students from Brookhaven mm -hmm. and take them over to Bell Elementary School for the few days that they will be out so that those families were able to access the equity hubs. So it, it is for our students currently who do have that level of need. We have shared this with all of our families as a proactive measure, um, which was very well received. And we, uh, we also were able to translate it into multiple languages and have had a lot of questions that come through. So very happy to be able to continue to support this need within our community. And just, I guess, a little bit of a follow-up to that. So now we're, we're sort of living this experience of um, evaluating schools for potential need to temporary close mm -hmm. and then providing a resource as far as equity hubs for students who need it. Are we doing a little follow-on after this first group of 16 schools moves through and um, reaching out to check and see if there were students who um, didn't participate in a hub and also didn't really engage in their school's virtual learning program to see if we can identify maybe some um, additional things we might do to make families aware of that opportunity or perhaps find out if they knew about it, why they were reluctant. So we, we did a couple of things and, and um, we went back to kind of the model that we used last year, but the recruitment was very important. So we worked with our PPWs and PCCs because they are aware of the families in the building that they work with most closely, as well as working through the student well-being team. So that was one layer of really being able to have that first round of families who um, we uh, the schools have been working with very closely, and we have the established relationships. The second round of recruitment was more of a wider net, um, looking for anyone who, were, who was seeking the opportunity, because as we know with the pandemic, things may have changed and maybe families may have not articulated that to us, but being able to understand it. The third component that you talked about is a yes. Um, and that will one, be through the student well-being teams because they are keeping in contact with students maybe similar to when we were in full virtual, children we have not heard from, um, parents maybe we're used to hearing from, but maybe we haven't heard from to really determine that opportunity. And then we also have to think through the lens um, of maybe there may be a space where someone just didn't raise their hand. So that will be that next wave um, to be able to see that as those schools start to transition back in. Okay, thank you. Um, so it's such a good, important opportunity, I think. Um, and then I had a question. Um, I think this is for you, Ms. Sharon. Um, so it, the Equity Initiatives Unit does amazing work in the school system. That, that um, Equity Matters newsletter is just one of the most amazing resources. Um, I know some of the really strong leaders in that unit have moved on. Are we fully staffed up in the Equity, Equity Initiatives Unit right now? No, we are not fully staffed right now. We are going to be hiring a director and a supervisor um, in early spring. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then you mentioned the equity certificate program at McDaniel and that we use that 144,000 um, resource 
um, to provide stipends, and so when when educators are participating in that program, they can get coverage. Do we also ha are, do we provide any other incentives for staff to participate in that um, equity certificate? Do we pay for or reimburse that that the costs for that training, or does our partnership with Bank Daniel cover that cost? Let's see if if. Uh, Dr. Nixon knows uh, has details about that of regarding tuition reimbursement process. Yeah, all that is tuition reimbursement reimbursable, if you will. Yes. Okay. I'll be talking about tuition reimbursement under the OHRD umbrella. Okay. Thank you very much. Ms. Madrowski. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I feel like this chapter is so important. I mean, in so much of the work that we're all trying to do right now across the system. You know, one thing with um, the social justice and the um, restorative justice practices is it really needs to be more proactive and not always just so reactive. And I too had asked at I think one of our last board meetings about how we are um, knowing if it's working. And, um, and I do think that it would be helpful if we could survey, I don't know if you survey people that participate in these programs, but even those that don't, just to kind of help try and identify areas that they feel that we're lacking in terms of proactive supports um, for folks. Um, and I did want to just comment to, um, to Ms. Wolf that we did make changes in our policy, um, elevating hate areas of hate crime to start at a higher level of discipline than regular um, disciplinary actions, um, just because I know you've mentioned it a couple times. Um, my other real question, um, though, is in terms of, because I do feel like the work that you all are doing is so important, I did notice that there's a, um, a decrease in some of the funding from staff training, and I was just curious as to why we would do that when we feel like we need to do so much more staff training. I don't see, I don't have a decrease in. It reads there are decreases of 926 from program supplies and 7,500 from staff training. In the, narrative. Mm -hmm. the only realignment that was done in the office about around the budget was we did move money um, for the OSI, OSI, is that the, what we're talking about, Yvonne? I believe, um, I believe that the realignments were in um, district-wide services and supports, and it was because from Yeah, I can explain. There were, real, there were realignments in my office, and they were minimal. Um, student welfare and compliance, that unit was originally attached to the chief of staff's office. They also co-shared an office suite with um, the Department of Leadership Development that works with all of our um, first, second year principals, our assistant principals, and uh, assistant school administrators. And they, um, they co-shared supplies. So I, in an effort to be able to provide them supplies on their own, that was a small shift that was made there. Okay, and you don't feel that we weren't using that money to do, to participate in additional staff training? No, we still have money set aside for staff training, um, but they just needed, I, I needed to use some internal money to be able to utilize supplies for them. So they will still do staff training. They offer staff training during the summertime. We looked at what we spent last summer as well as what we will prepare for moving forward. We also looked at opportunities. Um, we did full-scale training for our, our, our counselors this year under student welfare and compliance, and we were able to do that during the day, so substitute time was not needed for that. Some of that money also was to travel to conferences. There's no travel right now. Many of those opportunities are actually online. Um, and if we do need to pay someone, the rates of folks, we, uh, the decrease there is that they're not traveling for those opportunities. We can always go back and take a look at it if we see, especially moving into next year, that there's a shift and more is needed. But I did have to establish just the supply 
component that they needed. And because training looks very differently, um, just due to everything being virtual, it did create that space to be able to utilize those funds in a different way. And it's it's not substantial. I know. Where it would, would impact us um, having the ability to really be offers to offer something that's in need for students or staff or families. Okay, I like I said, I know it's not a, sub, you know, mm -hmm. $7,500 isn't a sub, super substantial amount of money, but I know also know as we're trying to hire more people, it's just the last thing I want to see suffer um, budget-wise would be staff training. So, thank you. Can I just respond to Ms. Mandrowski? Um, I do know that we made some changes to the discipline policy. I'm not sure that I think it's strong enough language anymore. Yeah, I wasn't sure either, but I was, um, but I really pushed that point um, based on parent and student feedback, and it was as strong as the um, legal team would allow us. <laughs> the other thing is, I think maybe what we could do too is look at the code of conduct and see if we need to strengthen mm -hmm. or. Or, or shorten the parameters in the code of conduct for moving to the next level. Thank you. That's what they suggested we do. Ms. Silvestri. <clears throat> um, thank you. I wanted to start out by um, uh, thanking Dr. McKnight for that additional budget work session. Yes. I think that we have heard loud and clear from our community and county council the need to better understand the overlap between our ESSER funds and our current operating budget. And so I I believe, I think I heard you say that we, that will give us an opportunity to do that in a public way so that it's crystal clear um, how that money is being well spent uh, with our children in our school system. So thank you for that. I also appreciate the, um, I always complain that it's hard to, to know the state of a particular topic when we come to this because the budget is just adding, subtracting, adding, subtracting. So I do appreciate your introductions because I think you're trying to give us kind of the state of your different um, offices um, as we work to develop a more um, functional budget. <laughs> uh, so thank you for that. Um, I did, because we talked a little bit about the anti-racist audit, I remembered our uh, racial equity and social justice impact statement that we, um, bring to the council every year. And I haven't seen one this year, so I was wondering if we are using the same one from last year, if it has been enhanced. I would think that with our one year under our belt with our anti-racist work, we are better able to fine tune uh, our budget because I would hope that the anti-racist audit also tells us how we can build a budget that is more equitably equitable and um, and socially just. So just wanted to get your thoughts about that. Yes, Ms. Silvestri, we are on the exact same uh, wavelength. I actually had a meeting uh, last week with the budget team um, in order for us to talk about what those equity impact and racial justice impact statements need, need to look like and how we need to provide clarity in each chapter under how it directly aligns. So last week, and then I'll kick it to the budget team if there's any additions. Uh, last week, uh, we worked collaboratively with the budget team in order to craft an email out uh, and to provide support from the equity initiatives unit in particular to each of the offices for each chapter to help it make sure that their impact statements are clearly, uh, I'm sorry, that their budget is clearly reflected in their impact statements. And I believe that they are all turning that in within the next week, equity units working in individually with offices that need additional support on that. As we move forward, um, you know, one of the things that we have partnered on uh, with the budget team is to really think about how the budget office and the Office of Street Strategic Initiatives can work together to ensure that some of our, our big initiatives that we're doing, as well as the strategic plan, is very, the connections are extremely clear for all of that. So yes, you should be able to see um, where in the strategic plan we the, the budget is reflected. And we're actually working collaboratively together, we have a meeting I think in another week, to actually go through and start crafting processes to create that um, so that transparency is there and can be elevated up as part of the work. Uh, but in terms of the budget process, mm -hmm. um, you will have to submit something to county council and when the, will mm -hmm. we see that as a board? I'll turn that over to the uh, budget team. Yes, that is starting last year. That is one of the requirements for our uh, when we turn the budget into the council. 
that's correct. So you will see that as well. Um, and as for the strategic initiatives, one of the ones for the budget team is to uh, create a program budget, as we've been discussing. That's one of our objectives. So, uh, so when do you think we'll see it? So let's plan to bring it back to the board the 24th when they have a chance to approve the final budget before it's sent to <laughs> county council. Okay. Thank you. And I just, I, I just want to emphasize that this is not just a requirement to county council. We have billions of dollars uh, in our hands, and we must do a better job of making sure that we are spending them with a racial equity and social justice lens. Um, so thank you for that. And my final question, um, this has been on top of mind for a while, but when you mentioned the vacancies in the equity office, it reminded me that I have this question. Um, what happens to the money for unfilled positions? We, we've, we've had a staffing shortage all year long. We weren't able to hire all those 50 social workers. Um, does that just go into the general fund and get used for realignments? Um, so uh, what you're talking about is turnover and lapse. These are two terms that um, uh, re regarding vacant positions, and that does help to balance the budget for the subsequent year. Um, that's, that's part of uh, what we use to, to fund the budget as well, because we anticipate that on an annual basis. That goes to our 25 million that we have to kind of correct. refund. Correct, our targeted fund balance, correct. And if I can just add, um, when we have vacancies, especially at schools, and we have long-term substitutes, those long-term substitutes, we don't have a specific budget for that. So those come out of the positions that are budgeted at the school. Obviously, there's savings because substitutes, you know, the cost is a little bit less, um, but that's part of um, what we use, you, you use those funds for. Also, as part of the budgeting process, we anticipate and we know that we're gonna have vacancies every year, so we don't budget, uh, accounting for every single position in the budget, we assume a, a portion of that, that we know they're gonna be vacancies and we don't budget for it. Thank you. Any questions on this then? Ms. Ohlone? Yeah, I first wanted to just echo what President Wolf had said earlier about the need to scale up our response to hate bias incidents, not just because we had um, a student, Lindsay Boitman, come and testify about the Sherwood Einstein response um, at an earlier board meeting, but also because speaking with students this year, when we returned in the fall, I think we all saw a lot more hate bias incidents at all of our sporting events back when we used to have spectators, um, a lot more than, than previous years. And I think the pandemic and 18 months of virtual learning really changed the way that we interact with people. Um, it made us not see people that are different from us, um, and that has interacted the way we interact with our peers. And so, um, especially now, I see that as really crucial for creating a safe environment for all students, especially those of color. Um, one question for you, Ms. Sharon, um, about the Equity Initiatives Unit. I heard you mention a lot of great resources, the newsletter being one, resource guides. They all sound optional to me. Right, and optional resources are great, but that means only the staff and the students who are really interested, who have made this a personal priority, are the ones that are going to be using them. Um, so looking forward, how do we uh, make these resources mandatory and or make sure they're reaching the staff and the students who need it most? Thank you for that, Ms. Saluni. Um, well, one of the things that is already built into the school improvement planning process that we're going to be expanding as a result of the audit is that every school needs to have a goal and track progress around equity. And that is something that we have continued to work on and that needs to be embedded throughout their goal. So that is not optional, their school improvement plan, that, that's, that's part of the process. And what we're doing as OTLS is working on revamping the school improvement, excuse me, planning process, we are working collaboratively with them to figure out how we're ensuring that we're embedding that work into their school improvement plan so that it is reflective of everything and how we are tracking that progress is gonna be evident in that too. So there are people working on that right now, but that has been an already a, a part of school improvement planning. We want to enhance it um, even more so. Um, and as we are working through the audit, one of the things that we are doing with both our steering committee, which is made up of students, staff, uh, community members, advocacy groups, et cetera, 
as well as uh, cross office teams. And in particular, we we're working with our ass uh, assistant chief of professional learning is we're working on a plan to determine what structures do we need to put in place for when this audit comes out so that we can move to action. So the school improvement planning process is one of them that we're moving to action. We also, because we're going to be releasing a, a stakeholder survey component of the audit that is going to be released by individual school data, we're going to be working with staff development teachers, we're going to be working with leaders in the system um, to, in order to create structures for them to unpack this work collaboratively with their communities so that they can, in a collaborative space with members of their community, help figure out what the next steps are for their school around this work and embed that into their school improvement planning processes. So that's some of the work um, that is, is coming along with that. And then we also are working on, as a result of the, of the audit, as I indicated before, there are six distinct areas in the audit that we are working on creating project teams that are gonna be evaluating the current state of the work around that office. So let's say workforce diversity. Dr. Nixon has presented extensively on the work that they have been doing. But then taking the information from the audit in order to scale up the work that they're doing to make sure that they're filling in any gaps that may have existed prior um, as a result. So those teams are gonna be forming and developing as well with our stakeholders. I appreciate that. I just wanted to share that feedback Absolutely. from the community and from my own experiences as a student. You know, the staff who really need these experiences the most are often those who are most disengaged. Um, but my next few questions go to Ms. Edwards. Uh, 75 students in our equity hubs, considering that we had, I think, 10 elementary schools closed um, until the, the 29th or the 30th or whatever number, it is, whatever date it is. Um, that seems like a really small number for me for the number of schools we have in virtual learning right now. Is that a capacity issue? Is that an interest issue? Because I really, I have a hard time believing that it is a, an interest issue. We can we continue to contact families to make sure that we offer that opportunity. Again, these were probably the first and second round one, that initial reach out before the Equity Hubs even started to all of our families across um, all of our schools to share that the opportunity is coming. We want to uh, create a list of people who will have that opportunity, but we continue to engage families around inviting them into the Equity Hubs. So it's not necessarily capacity, um, but we do um, take care of like the registration. We do all of those logistical pieces to make it as easy as possible. So it does seem pretty low for the number of sites that we have and we definitely recognize that, but we'll continue to work with our families as much as possible. And the principals at those schools have also been great credible messengers around it as well. They shared it when the schools were closed. They've also talked to their families as well as when they were picking up students. We've advertised it again as they've come in and picked up meals. So um, we are definitely doing it in multiple ways and not just the writing, which is critical. So we're, you know, we're calling and talking in person as well. I appreciate that. Making sure we're continuing to push mm -hmm. that out, not just when the schools originally closed, no. out, but throughout the period. And, um, and that was a big thing. We wanted people to know in advance um, and, and have it in their mind so they didn't have to worry at all when this, if and when this time came. And I noticed two of our 10 elementary schools that have been closed for that 10 day period were not listed on um, the list of schools for which equity hubs are available. Um, if parents at those two schools are worried about childcare, uh, where should they go? Is there a resource available for them? They can go to one of the, the neighboring schools that are close by to be able to get them there. Um, they can either transport their own children or we can work with transportation. Um, Again, working with transportation, one of the and one of the things that we'll talk about at the upcoming meeting around out of school time is just really cre being creative around how we get students to these opportunities, recognizing the staffing shortage that we do have in terms of our drivers, but those families are able to enroll at other locations as well. Um, and then my last question on, on this topic specifically is, I understand and, and really appreciate the need to think about continuing to scale up our equity hubs this school year as we explore the possibility of additional school closures. Uh, but this is the 2023 fiscal year budget, right? So what is the role of equity hubs that we're preparing for uh, a year from now, right? What, is, what, is, what are those funds being, being saved and, and 
plan for? I think you attended a meeting I had not too long ago where we discussed this. Um, right now, we're operating in the immediate need. Um, we have, as, as we discussed around when we look at uh, these spaces where we are examining schools that may need to move to a virtual platform, it's a right now need that we want to be able to provide families to be able to go to work, but still know that your child is supervised, they're receiving their instruction, and they have someone that's going to relay information back to their teacher. The long scale work that we did discuss blends in with the work that, uh, and the examination around out of school time. What we do know is at the elementary level, the opportunities at every elementary school around academic opportunities are not always there, as well as the opportunity for extracurricular activities activities that include recreation and fine arts. So we do have to build that space out and that is a place for us to long-term look at how equity hubs do come into play to be able to support students within our schools that have the after-school care programs. The other space is not only equity hubs for after school, but we also, um, one area we also discussed was before school because that's a need for many families as well. And then the consideration for the weekend um, too. So we do have a long-term project that we do need to build out. So it doesn't become reactive should we ever be in this space again, it's already a pre-established kind of standard operating procedure and a ready resource for families that they know is there, they can access and be able to utilize at any point in time. Um, our child care providers, as well as um, uh, Montgomery County, um, uh, Montgomery County, um, Government has been really great as we stand these up and the level of flexibility that it, it that goes into it as well. I appreciate that and, and just um, reflecting on the need to build those permanent structures. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was Dr. McKnight who said the other day, this is no longer a, a pandemic, this is an endemic. So recognizing that we need permanent structures um, and systems and operations and infrastructure that allows us to continue to deal with waves of the virus or whatever the next challenge is gonna be um, without having to do a complete overthrow of our operations. Thank you. And provide stability as right. well. Uh, I'd like to make one comment on to what Ms. Aluni said. Um, this is about visioning for the future. This budget should be everything we've learned over the last couple of years and how we are visioning for, yes, current issues and then what we wanna build on. Another idea, and maybe bringing this back, uh, Ms. Edwards, when you all come back to present, um, I know we had a lot of community investment in having our equity hubs work as spaces uh, for parent connection to the school system to better understand programming uh, so that we could bring programs to them and have it as kind of in a way serve as like centers of, uh, again, how do we bring the school system into neighborhoods? So I know that was a part of a discussion that some of our community members had and they thought, you know, hubs could not just be used during the day for students, but also for families. So I think that's another um, part that we want to look into to bring in stakeholders to see how they envision that space because we do want it to work for the entire family as well. And we've learned during the pandemic, it is not that everyone should come to MCPS for everything, but it definitely benefits us to be in the neighborhood and in the communities mm -hmm. in a way to make information more available and to build those relationships. Thank you. Dr. Daka. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to say that um, there's been considerable interest today in uh, the anti-racist audit and the work with the multi um, mid-Atlantic mid center. However, as a board, we are going to have to make sure that the reports from that group do not come at the end of the meeting because they did the last time and we had hardly any questions, not like the questions that you're doing tonight. So I'm gonna ask whoever does this, I think it's our staff, to make sure that that doesn't happen again because these are important uh, issues that we really need to talk about and we can't leave it at the end because often when all of the other questions are asked in the first part, when you get to the end, whatever is there, we give it short shrift. I don't know, you can all slap me if you want. Now, uh, the other thing I wanted to ask about was partnerships. Um, does that include partnerships with universities to develop teachers? It does, Dr. Daka. Okay, well, this, this will take a little time. In the African-American culture, we have 
organizations that are service organizations, fraternities and sororities, and as you well know, uh, one is called Lynx. I belong to that and so do some other people that I know. The director of my division is the associate um, director of the law school at Howard. Her best friend handles the education department at Howard. She asked me, why were we not partnering with Howard to get our student teachers and, you know, recruiting? When she spoke with her friend who was in charge of education at Howard, she said, it is a money issue. It means that they're charging too much or we're not willing to give enough in order to partner with them. I don't know whether that's true or not, but I'm throwing it out there because these are two very responsible people in, in uh, education and in law who have stated this uh, as a thing that's happened. So I, I think we need to know that because we're always talking about uh, the kind of recruiting and are we working with the universities that have Latino and African American teachers because we're, we're really low on those. So just wanted to throw that out. Thank you. Um, we will follow up on that. Okay, thank you. I think we're up to chapter seven. Do you want to continue? We will now turn this over to um, Mr. Pete Giovanni, Associate Superintendent of Technology and Innovation. So good morning. Uh, sorry, good morning, President Wolf, uh, board members, Dr. McKnight. Um, first slide, please. I think it's on. Good. Uh, chapter 7 is built on the Office of Technology and Innovation, or OTI, as people like to call it. We provide high-quality technology systems and services essential to teaching and learning. The office is committed to excellence in providing technology solutions to support teachers, engage students, and assists in the effective business operations of Montgomery County Public Schools. I want to first thank all the members of the Office of Technology and Innovation team, including but not limited to Emily Barr, Pete Dejasaki, Sandra Karras, Chuck McGee, Pinky Pamnani, who is in the virtual audience today, and Kara Trenkamp. Together with their teams, we have successfully supported the old and new education landscape, including virtual and in-person instruction. Over the past few years, there's been a lot of focus on IT spending and budgets to ensure that our school system is fully supporting the needs of this new landscape. Over the last 12 months or so, we have distributed over 14,000 laptops to our staff We've supported 160,000 plus Chromebooks. We have installed over 2,000 smart boards in our schools. Those are the box lights that people refer to. We've held over 450 trainings and we have resolved over 80,800 help desk tickets. We've also launched a new financial system and a new budget system. We've improved our system's bandwidth from 20 gigabytes of internet capacity to 60 gigabytes of internet capacity so we can ensure that teaching and learning remains effective. We've completed the installation of wireless access points in every classroom at all schools so every classroom can connect easily to important curricular content. And finally, we've replaced over 1,000 end-of-life network switches in schools throughout the county. This upcoming year, we hope it is much less exciting, but just as effective. So now let me give you an overview of our school year 23 budget. The first slide that you see depicts how we will serve our community for the FY23 school year and is largely unchanged from last year with only a few exceptions. Our budget request is $38.9 million, and as you can see, it is spread over staff, services, and devices. Next slide, please. 
There are several positions in this chapter, but all are realigned from internal groups with no net increase in staffing. These align realignments represent continued modernization of our work, including the continued focus on cybersecurity and the new HR system. The media service technicians, or MSTs, that you see, the 25 positions, are moved from the high school area to OTI and are the result of a committee that started in 2019 and consisted of high school principals, MSTs, and central office staff. This move will provide better support to the MST group and enables them to advance through skills development and training. It is important to note here that the MSTs are not moving from their schools. That's very important. Our office is simply providing better support to the schools and to the MSTs. And helping to both evaluate the MSTs as well, and as well as help the schools to address any issues that arise. But again, it's important to reiterate that MSTs are not moving from their schools. Next slide, please. Finally, there are some rate changes that are the result of price increases from various software vendors. The rate change increase represents about six tenths of 1% of the OTI budget. And with that, I can answer any and all of your questions, I hope. Please turn your light on, Ms. Aluni. Yeah, continuing our previous conversation about stability and navigating through crisis, I really see technology as an important opportunity uh, to be able to do that. I was talking with actually Dr. Dawson the other day um, about our recent crisis with our loss of bus drivers um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, and we were talking about the routing software that we currently use in the Department of Transportation. It seems as if it's a little outdated, and maybe if we were able to update it to a newer software, we could pick up some routes, combine them, and maybe not even have any out-of-service routes at all. So I don't know if you've uh, talked about the, the routing software that we currently use and, and possible upgrades. Thank you for that question. Um, currently, that office is looking at purchasing new software. We are working with them collaboratively to ensure that the software meets their needs as well as the needs of the system and it fully integrates as well with Synergy. For example, there are softwares that are out there that actually a parent can get on Synergy and find out what the bus route is, where to contact, where to provide information, et cetera. So we are working with them on that issue. And is that reflect not reflected in this budget? It's not in our budget, but it is in their budget, in the transportation budget. Okay, is that a separate chapter that we're gonna look at? Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, and actually, you provided a wonderful transition to my next question, which I know is a, a topic the board has already discussed uh, previously, but um, because of our issues with bus, bus drivers and having a lot of absences. I know students, even more than in previous years, um, wait times have had, for, for buses, have had a lot more variability. Um, weather has been really unpredictable. And um, I've always been really interested as a longtime bus rider myself in, in having a bus tracking app. Um, especially if it does become the case where we're able to uh, change bus drivers' routes and have them pick up others, and then the number might change, and having all of that information readily available, available for students and families, I think, would really, really help with stability. Um, but. Yeah, I'll leave it to you to respond to that. I know that those topics were discussed and characteristics were discussed. I've not heard from transportation on the status, but I do know that they have discussed that specific issue with us. On, in other words, how to find out in real time right. where that bus is, whether you're waiting at the bus stop or you're at home, finding out why your child has not come home yet. That happens all the time. So that that is a characteristic I know of, or I believe of the RFP that's been put out there, the, R, the request for proposals for, for the whatever new software they will select. Oh, so that would be part of the, the software that we previously discussed? I believe so, yes. Great, great. Um, my last question, I know, I think it was Baltimore County Public Schools. Last year or the year before, had a ransomware attack, mm -hmm. very disruptive. Our federal government has had ransomware attacks. I mean, no one is, is really safe. Um, so cybersecurity is really 
a great concern for me and I know a lot of other students, especially at a time when we're transitioning so much of our instruction and being even more reliant than we previously were on virtual mediums. Um, just if I could get a sense of where we are with, with cybersecurity and possibly increasing our investment in that. Ms. Looney, thank you for that question. That's a great question. We try and be very quiet about how we do cybersecurity yes. so that we don't pay attention to ourselves. However, what I can tell you is that Chuck McGee and the cyber team work hard every day. We discuss every day about cyber threats yes. and about things that they do on a daily basis to mitigate those things. If and I will say no more than that, except that we always keep our eye on the ball on that issue because we know that first and foremost, that is the most critical thing of keeping our students, our data, and our system safe. I appreciate that, thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Evans. Yes, um, thank you for the presentation and I heard you state a couple of times, which was helpful for me, that the MSTs, which is the media service technicians, are not leaving their schools. Yes. Can you explain um, the thinking behind them coming to, you said you moved them from um, chapter one. Yes. You moved them to a more central located area and they're still part of their schools. Can you just explain like what the difference in that support would, would be? I know when we had our, it's kind of hard to hear me. I know we had our um, annual meeting with SEIU Local 500. That was one of the issues that kept coming up, that at the high schools, it was very difficult to be able to support um, the schools around technology, like just whatever type of um, issues might come about. They didn't feel like they had enough support. So how is this helping to support our high schools? Can you Thank you for that question. So historically, Prior to, I've been here five years, so prior to that, MSTs were 12 months, and the technology, you know, 10 years ago, eight years ago, related to VCRs, Betamax devices, projectors, et cetera, and the technology has changed and become much more advanced and in line with the traditional technology support staff. And so, they were moved from 10, 12 months to tw 10 months prior to, I, must have, I think it was seven years ago. <clears throat> they wish to move back to 12 months and to better support the high schools, we would like to eventually, not next year, it's not in the budget for next year, but eventually work on moving them to 12 months, but also upskilling their skills to make them more in line with the traditional ITSSs who are the technology support staff so that the schools, every high school, will have two people instead of one person who can provide the same level of support. And that's the idea behind it. It has worked well, that shared ownership of these staff at the middle and elementary school level. So they had approached us to uh, make this a reality along uh, 2019, pre-pandemic, of course. <clears throat> And so those issues relate to the beginning of that. And our goal is to both make them whole and also provide better skills and training and support for the schools. Okay, that helped me. Maybe I was getting the two positions mixed up. Did you mention the RTSs? I, I, I'm not familiar with all the acronyms. You said the, at the school they have the R, what was the acronym you used? Yes, yes. I'm sorry, the, the computer, sorry about that. The computer support, they're called ITSSs, and they're basically the computer support technicians who actually work in every school. Okay. At the high schools, there's one per school all the time. At the middle and entry, elementary school, they're shared among schools. Okay. So the MSTs would eventually, we would like to have them skilled, and they would like to be skilled at the same level of the other computer support people because that technology has advanced to that level. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Mandrowski. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, a couple of things. Um, I know we're gonna be talking about the uh, busing stuff during transportation, but I do know that uh, Mr. Watkins had looked at a bus tracking app um, that we, it was very, it was expensive, so it unfortunately didn't get funded. But, um, you know, as technology continues to evolve and certain new things become not so new anymore and less expensive, maybe that's something we could really seriously revisit. 
Um, I don't know if you have or not, but um, what's that? And uh, yeah, I know. I'm saying we should that it was already looked at. This is what I'm saying. Um, HR processing um, updates and things like that. Um, I know you said previously that we would be have our system fill finished being updated in what 2024. Correct. I believe that's when most of it launches. And then the following nine months later, January 1st, and then the nine months later becomes one component of it later on, which is, I believe, the recruitment component nine months later. Yes. Nine months later after the January 2024. Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. I didn't know if we've looked at other ways of expediting that at all, but um, it just seems like it's taken a long time. Um, but then my last question is updated electronics for our virtual learning. You know, we heard testimony um, about some of that. Um, and even as you're purchasing things for in the classrooms, the new whiteboards and, and things like that, um, how are we ensuring that um, we have what we need to make sure, you know, that our the special education um, technology and the virtual academy technology is all um, being appropriately funded so that we can make sure that, like I think that that was the suggestions by the gentleman that testified at the board meeting were very, very good ones, but I would assume that's not something that had already been budgeted in. Is that something that we can look at making sure we have the funding for? Yes, absolutely, Ms. Podrowski. Um, I know special ed has their own funding for technology individually, so they do have that, and we are also working with the Virtual Academy. I know that the, the, the person who testified spoke about a monitor, for example, enhancing instruction. Um, one example of that is that we can, we have 1,200, 1,200 surplus monitors that we can provide those students available for checkout very soon. We are only waiting on, we're going to order a $10 wire that actually allows the monitor to connect to the Chromebook. Once we get that, we can allow students in the virtual academy to check these monitors out on a need by need basis because some students will not need them some students will not want them but others who do will have those available to them and that's going to be happening over the next month or so as soon as we get those wires in okay so just to add to that just to add to that miss mondrowski one of the other things that the virtual academy leaders are engaging in in alignment with their pta and the naacp rep mr whitfield who spoke the other day is not just to be focusing on the monitors which obviously is a need um, and a great example but they're conducting focus groups with their students their parent communities and surveying them as well as the staff to figure out in this unique world that they are educating students in how do we go beyond what are the needs beyond just a monitor what kind of software might be unique to the needs of the virtual academy environment. So they can ensure, particularly as they plan for next year, that they have the most robust system because in addition to providing people technology, as we will get out from these focus groups, in addition to figuring out what hardware and software is necessary, we know that there's going to be professional learning connected to that to make sure that it is appropriately being implemented, not just for staff, but for the students and for the community so they can best support their, their learners. So although we do have monitors that we can do, we're trying to be even more robust with how we are addressing this. Um, and Mr. Whitfield, I do have to say, has been an amazing uh, companion. I mean, I think almost every single person in the Virtual Academy reached out to him after that presentation. He probably was inundated. Yeah. But now we're bringing his expertise in as well as other members of that community in to really help make sure that we are addressing the unique needs of the program. I really appreciate that you are utilizing his expertise and, um, and your comments there because the, the last thing I was going to say was just about it's not just about the monitors for the students, but equipment for staff. Um, also, as we start to look at the future going forward in terms of how we could be doing um, like any kind of simultaneous learning for students who are out that would bring ease to the teachers so that it's not a complicated process if, if it was something that we were to some point look at. So thank you for your work on that. The, the 
one last thing just to mention, uh, Ms. Mondrowski, too, and this is just for the edification of the of the team, too, is that we get a very large, and, and, and Mr. Chevanini can expand on this, but we get money from uh, in our tech mod budget um, from the uh, county council and that actually funds most of our actual like devices and whatnot that go into the building. And right now it's, it's just in a, in a uh, it's not approved yet, but right now they have earmarked about 26 million for MCPS in that, which is extremely generous. Um, and it has been a, a, an increase from prior years. So I don't know if you have any additional um, info on that. No, we traditionally have always been using TechMod for refreshing of devices as well as boards, uh, smart boards, et cetera, and we do that on a four-year cycle. Um, that's changed, of course, because we gave a lot of students devices in one shot as well as the staff devices in one shot. There are some concerns that I'm hearing from the TechMod budget where I'm hearing that the county uh, has recommended cuts to that budget, so I'm not really sure what that's going to mean and play out with. Um, but the issue is we're good right now, but over the next four years, we have to make sure that we put in and, uh, and plan for refreshing these devices so that teachers and students have the most current technology available to learn and to teach. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I know a lot of our private schools are doing that, too, so yes. thank you. Can I just ask a follow-up question? How many kids, I refresh my memory about how many kids are in the virtual academy? Current number is about a little over 2,600. And you have 1,200 monitors? Are you, did I understand you? Are you purchasing more? I know that you said everybody will not want one, but I think when they start to see the advantage of a larger screen, it's going to become quite popular. I mean, you're down about 1,400 from the number of kids you already have in there. Is the plan to purchase some more? We will plan to purchase more. Monitors right now are about $300 each. So our goal is to wait in as much as possible to find out what that need is, determine what that need is, and then purchase them. The supply chain issues that, of course, we had during the pandemic are less now, so we're a lot less concerned about those supply chain issues. Are also what we've heard feedback wise from students and staff is that quite possibly not all the students will want them or need them because again the more stuff you have the more stuff can break and the more stuff you're responsible for so our goal is to let them by choice decide what they want on the monitor piece of it and if we if we you know if we predict that we're going to run out, we'll make sure that we purchase more to accommodate all of our students. Okay, but that twelve hundred would include staff and students right now. Yes, correct. So you'll be including staff in any numbers you're looking at in the future too. Yes, in the virtual academy. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, uh, Ms. Silvestri. Thank you. Um, some of my questions have been addressed already. Um, this question is about uh, follow up to Ms. Madrowski's about our HR system, which is uh, two years away, plus more, two years and nine months away. Um, I, what, uh, what's taking so long? So the, the HR system had to be designed after the, uh, the um, financial system went live because the HR system is contingent on the financial system. So once the financial system went live and all the components were there, which is now, then the planning of the HR system, which is, it's not a, a system you, we, you purchase right out of, the, out of a box. It's a system you, that's being designed and built according to the needs of the human capital office and according to the needs of the system. That takes time. We have uh, contractors and we have uh, companies that actually design that. And so in order to design it effectively, it takes some time to make sure it's done correctly. Thank you. Um, along the same lines, Ms. Sharon, um, in public testimony, we heard from parents about frustrations in terms of uh, grading and it's here, it's not here, and then teachers also have talked about the ease of use or lack thereof our, of our systems in terms of where they put the grades. Um, you gave an explanation there in public hearing, 
but then the parents were like, no, that's not what's happening, and they were going to talk to you to see where the disconnect is. Did you have a chance to talk to them? Um, what can we do to both make our parent system and our teacher system more efficient and easy to use? Thank you. Yes, I did follow up with all of those parents, um, and we did engage in a conversation around what the problem was. Also followed up with some of the OTI staff to better understand what the parents were seeing versus what was going on on the back end. And there seems to be a combination, based on what we discussed, there's a combination that's existing between some things that are happening on the user's end versus some things that are happening on the parent's end that are not connecting. So one of the things that OTI is going to be engaging in, and this is a project that Mr. Chevanini is going to be leading, is engaging in parent focus groups because one of the goals that we have as far as synergy is concerned in OTI, which we had set forth in the summer, is how do we ensure that synergy in particular parent view, which is the main way that we have parents communicating and identifying things to school, or that we're accomplishing two things. One, that it is an ease of communication for the parents so that it is an easily accessible tool that they can understand and use. Two, that the parents are actually accessing it. We have pulled some data by school. And we see that some school communities have very high parent view activation in the 70% and 80%. But then we see, with full transparency, our more impacted schools and our schools that have large populations of our black and brown students are, are seeing activations in some instances as low as 30%. So what, we're, what Mr. Chevanini is going to be leading with his team is the first step is going to be to engage in culturally responsive focus groups that engage our stakeholders in a way to really understand what they need as users to better utilize this platform so that it really is serving for homeschool communication. The second phase of that process, once we have those focus groups, is then will we'll be to do two things. Determine what needs to be fixed on the vendor's part on Synergy. Are there upgrades or changes there that need to happen? The third part is, is to say, okay, well, if there is or isn't, there'll probably be a mixture of both. How are we then targeting our individual communities, again, in that culturally responsive way by engaging our advocacy groups to help us with some of this work in order to educate more about Synergy, get them activated, because as you know, this is actually one of our objectives that is built into our strategic plan. So that is the work that is forthcoming. Uh, Mr. Chevanini and I are just starting to kind of hash out the plan for what that looks like, but that is priority work that we do as a system to ensure that we're providing what, what our users need. Thank you, and I hope that you can do focus groups with teachers as well to see how we can make it easier for them to use. Thank you for that, and I didn't mention this, but we did recently have full day in-person, um, I'm sorry, excuse me when I say in-person, Zoom, um, sessions for teachers to drop in and provide feedback on their experiences with Synergy. These drop-in sessions were led not just by um, MCPS staff, but our actual Synergy consultants were there as well to hear the issues and have compiled that feedback. They also have a survey that is currently open that is out to all staff, so they provided that in-person opportunity as well as that survey opportunity so that we can make sure that we're meeting the needs of our staff as well. Thank you. I mean, this is in the strategic plan because um, there should be no surprises to parents when at the end of the quarter and the semester because their assignments, that, that they can get information in almost real time. And we need parents to be partners in education. So we need them to, to be engaged in that. Uh, my final question is about the virtual academy. There was a lot of interest from the board in terms of growing that next year. And there was no additional funding put into it. But um, should we have a big demand for it come August, where maybe now 6,000 kids want in it, um, will, how will we allocate resources just so that we're not, we can't say, oh, sorry, we can't uh, serve more than 3,000 because that's what we did last year. What is, what is your thought process in terms of being able to expand with this budget um, and be nimble, should the demand be there? So, and I will ask the budget team to correct my thinking if I'm incorrect in what I'm about to say. <laughs> so one of, the, one of the key things that we presented when we shared on the virtual academy was 
um, when you were looking at all the realignments and, and, and how it was looking for the, the current budget of Virtual Academy, one of the things that we did not do last year that we are doing this year is basically we talked about that per pupil allocation and how that per pupil allocation will move to the Virtual Academy if the student goes to the virtual academy, right? We didn't do that when we set up the virtual academy due to the timeline and the nature of, of what we were trying to accomplish. So the idea is, is that if we expand, we can expand when students come, per pupil allocation comes. Now, of course, we would, I'm seeing nods, so I'm assuming that I'm on the right track with that. Um, one of the things that you are going to hear about in much more detail in the, in the March 24th presentation is the future of Virtual Academy um, and, and more specifics around what you all, all have communicated as interests and need in the district, but not just Virtual Academy in and of itself, but how are we expanding this vision of digital learning throughout the district? We know that the, the one positive thing we can say that has come out of this pandemic, if we're gonna say any positive thing has come out of it, is the fact that we need to put technology and digital learning at the center of innovation in our work. So what you're going to hear about in March are some expanded um, initiatives led by the Office of Strategic Initiatives that are going to be branching out from, from the virtual academy. So in addition to expanding some of the opportunities in the virtual academy, expanding opportunities for all students in other realms so that we're bringing not just digital learning experiences, but as you know, when we take a look at our economy um, and, and, and the high profile jobs around STEAM programs, how are we really integrating that and providing authentic experiences to students on a broad level. We have a big, big vision we're going to share and then some steps along the way that we're going to start taking. So I'm really excited to be able to unveil that to you all in March. Ms. Harris. Yes, thank you. And uh, uh, Ms. Mandrowski um, asked my questions about Mr. Whitfield's testimony. Um, and I'm just so glad to hear the, the really um, robust partnership there and how the um, Mr. Chevanini's office is and, and yours, Ms. Sharon, are really valuing the end user experience and making sure what they know about what we're doing is informing the work because that, I think, sometimes is our missing piece. And um, that's how we, we really make sure that we're, we're satisfying the needs of our, of our school communities. Um, and I also appreciated what you said, building on what uh, Dr. Trenkamp told us earlier about moving forward the vision of taking the per pupil funding for the virtual academy students and shifting that funding to um, into the, the the academy itself and away from the um, comprehensive schools um, so I'm, we'll be looking forward in March to hearing too how um, so that's a big funding piece for the students who commit to the virtual academy writ large but when we're also looking to expand opportunity and access to unique courses through the academy but n not but students who are still, home, you know, mostly students at their home school, how we do that, how we build in that, um, that funding piece to make those opportunities robustly available. Um, and then this is one, this, this question is for Mr. Shivaniti, and I apologize, I might just be getting my MCPS lingo behind. Mm -hmm. But um, so when I was teaching, um, we had an ITSS at our school, it was wonderful. And, but you're, uh, the media service technician, the MST, that you're, is that the same thing? The media service te technician is not the same thing currently, but eventually we would like to make it the same thing. In the past, when the media service technicians were, um, were founded and were integral, media technology was very different than um, computer technology. Well, that line is grayed significantly, right? M we know that most um, media technology inter in is integrated into computers and the networks, et cetera. So our goal is to make them similar in skill level and uh, grade level, et cetera, because right now those media service technicians are below grade of ITSSs. And so our goal is to both train them but also provide the support for them and for the schools, most importantly, to be able to be equal because their skill level needs to be equal. Okay, so we'll have both, a robust yes, correct. population, both ITSSs and MSTs. Correct. Our goal is that each high school will have effectively 
two ITSSs. One will be called an MST, okay. but they'll have the same skill level or similar skill levels at each high school. But the goal is not to move them or change them. The principals, if they're happy with theirs, they will, they will not have to be concerned ever about losing their, their MST or their ITSS or whoever to someplace else. Our goal is to simply better support the schools when issues arise and also better train the MSTs and make sure that they have the current training of technology. Yeah, that's great. And I see, you know, this is another piece of our grow your own because I bet we've got students right now who would be amazing in both of those roles, getting them to come back to us. Okay, thank you. Okay, Ms. Aluni. Yes, Ms. Sharon, I have a question for you about the Virtual Academy, and I apologize, this is moving back to a previous chapter, okay. um, but I don't feel like I got the response I, I needed at our last um, session when this was covered. Can you tell me about the financial capacity of the Virtual Academy to, in regards to that vision that we've talked about where students can take courses that are not offered at their school, the financial capacity of the Virtual Academy to do that. Because right now, we have a same services budget, and that's not really part of the services that we provide besides the very, very limited, um, I believe it's compacted math that we're starting to do that with. Um, but can you talk about the financial capacity of our academy to be able to do that. I really would like the 2023 school year to be kind of a pilot year and in, in offering students courses that um, aren't physically in person at their school, but they can take online. Th thank you, Ms. Saluni. Um, so it, the, the, it, there, it's a complex question you're asking, right? Because the first thing that we need to do is figure out what those courses are, and that's what the team is working on right now, and what the need is at the home schools, right? Because there's a lot of courses that home schools can provide. So what we're trying to figure out is what can't they provide so that we can determine what access we need to provide. So that's a collaborative conversation with the actual schools as they're going through their articulation process, which is what we're, go which is what we're going to do. We also are gonna take a look at, well, are there some signature programs that we can provide within the virtual academy that could be open you know, to, to, to students in that realm as well? So what you have to remember is, is that I, we, we also have, in addition to our operating budget right now, we have a significant amount of money that is also, and I'll let them jump in too, and this is where maybe I think on February 14th we're talking about ESSER. Um, this is where the ESSER funds also come into play because we are, we are expecting, based on how we want to expand to meet the needs, to, to be using ESSER funds as well to help supplement some of this as we are moving forward because we have not used, I, and. I'll, I'll let the budget team speak for the exact amount in ESSER. I want to say 39 million was the original amount for Virtual Academy that we allocated in ESSER 3. I know we haven't used all of that money, and we are continuing to use that as we build up the program, but I will. So, yes, we allocated, we allocated about 33 million, close to that, for the Virtual Academy, and the Virtual Academy is fully funded this year through the SR3 grant, but that's one of the initiatives that we started to move to the operating budget. So if you, um, if you remember back in chapter one, what we basically did is the structural piece of the virtual academy, the directors, the counselors, everything that is non-enrollment based uh, is budgeted in the virtual academy. Then at a as the students move from their home school to the virtual academy, the resources from those home schools as much as possible. It's not gonna be 100% because if you have a school that loses 100 students, you know, some teachers would move with those students, but we will have to supplement some of that with the ESSER 3. And then as we see how it develops, you know, in the next year or so, then we can keep, fun, you know, moving, putting resources in the operating budget to continue finding, funding the virtual academy. Does that help? So is the plan to, as we go through the course registration process, which is starting now, actually, mm -hmm. for, for courses where we're not able to make a full class at a high school, for example, so in two years ago, that class would just not be offered. Correct. This year, our plan is to bring that into the virtual academy and still allow those students to take that class. So we're currently working with the schools to figure out what those high needs courses are, okay. and then that is our goal to see what we can do to expand that. 
Um, so we have to, because remember, there's components with staffing. We got to make sure we have a teacher that can teach it. A lot of times when they can't offer it, it has to do with the fact that these are courses that I will use upper level French as a, as a prime example. A lot of times we struggle with just finding a teacher to teach it. And it has more to do with that sometimes than the numbers. But if we have one teacher that can pull multiple kids from around an area and they are situated in the virtual academy, which for many people is a more attract, some, for some people even a more attractive uh, teaching environment for them. Um, so there are perks to wanting to do that. Then we can, we can offer that. So those things have to happen at the same time. Because you also have to remember if I'm pulling, let's, I'll use the upper level French as an example. I'll use French 5. Okay, we've got um, Paint Branch and Whitman and uh, Gaithersburg High School all have a small number of French 5 students. They don't have a teacher, they can't, they can't do it, they contact the virtual academy. Then the virtual academy has to say, okay, one of the first things they have to figure out is when in the day is the kid going to be able to take it that's gonna align with three different high school schedules? That's a, that's a complexity because they have to build it around what the virtual academy can provide and then they might have restrictions in their schedule. So it's not just a matter of saying, okay, just jump in the virtual academy. It has to make sure it's a match, which is why, and this is, and like I said, this is really innovative work. No district has really engaged in this before. So that's why we have to go through a process of exploration to better understand how we can make it work. It's not a simple answer just to, we can just move them. And we don't have a simple answer to say how many we can serve. That's why the articulation process, that data collection process is gonna be so integral, which as you indicated, is occurring in January, and that we stay in close touch with OTLS and the, and the principals, particularly in the high schools, because we find that that's where the biggest need lies, so that we can try to match as effectively as possible. I appreciate that. And just listening to you talk is making me think of a lot of other problems that need to be solved before this vision can become a reality, like universal bell times, right? Thinking about that for next year. And I'm sure we'll talk about that later at another session. But my focus for right now while we're in the budget discussion is making sure so we have the money to be able to do that. I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I don't feel okay. like we don't have the money to, to be able to, right. to provide uh, those programming. I'm not, I don't, I don't think that's a problem at this point. Okay, time. great. Thank you. And then lastly, um, sorry to extend the discussion, but Mr. Chevanini, I walked into my school, I think like two months ago, um, and where I usually saw my Promethean boards, I saw these brand new devices, smaller, um, lit from the back instead of a projection, and that was in every single one of my classrooms, and I know students in other schools experience that as well. Can you talk about the reasoning for why we're switching to this new technology, the cost, and that's part of this operating budget. Thank you. Ms. Aloni, thank you for that question. Those new devices are actually, the, the term that, that you hear often is called box lights. Yes. They're smart boards as well, but they're more generic. So if, as you think about older TVs that had a shelf life of only four or five years, these box lights have a shelf life that we have anticipated of 10 years so that the bulb does not dim. I don't know if you've experienced classrooms where the teachers teach and the bulbs are dim. Those are very expensive to replace. The smart boards have better functionality so that, for example, they can provide wireless access from teachers um, they can move around the classroom. They're much better, um, they might have much better resolution so you can see them better in all different parts of the classroom, et cetera. We've installed over 2,000, but I think we have an additional 1,600 to go because again, it does take time to install them. There are places in the district where we're installing them in front of the old boards. We've seen pictures of that. We are planning to remove the old boards, but our goal is to install the new ones first and make sure all of them work and the teachers are trained and then go back behind them where it's not a disruption to the classroom to remove the old ones. Yeah, I'm in, one, I'm in a few of those classrooms. Yes. But that's an aesthetic issue. Um, so uh, 2,000 installed, 1,600 to go. That means there's 3,600 classrooms total. Is that the high school number or all secondary schools or all classrooms in the district? That's, all, that's the entire number for this year. But our goal is every year to install them. We installed some the previous year. Okay. And that is more along the lines of the, re, re, the traditional refresh cycle that happens every year over four years. Um, the, the smart are over 10 years, to be honest. So there are plans to 
and st to make all of our smart boards the new box lights or whatever the generic TVs effectively, right? So whether it's a Samsung TV or an LG TV or whatever, the smart board, currently they're box lights, but the goal is to replace all of our Promethean boards to the new box lights. They also have better software functionality as well. Is there a goal date that we have in mind for that? We have not because it's pending funding, so. Okay. And that's part of this operating budget is that the cost of bringing that, those new boards in. It is. We okay. actually purchased some with ESSER money, and we purchased some with this year's TechMod money. Um, hopefully, if the money gets returned to us on TechMod for next year, our goal is to purchase the same or even more for next year to install in the classrooms. And just making sure we're prioritizing our classrooms with the highest need and schools with the highest need in that installation process. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. You're welcome. Ms. Harris. Um, yes, just a quick follow-up, and I really do appreciate the forward thinking and kind of the global vision of this work. Um, I think um, it, it's the kind of thinking that I think really helps us to move forward effectively. Um, so this question, I think, would go to you, uh, Ms. Sharon. We're talking about, and moving on, um, Ms. O'Looney's question on the how, we're, how we are thinking through the expansion of making um, certain unique classes more widely available. Are we, I think I know the answer to this, I just don't want to assume. Um, are we looking also at some of our very unique CTE courses, for instance, um, at Magruder, the aviation class, which is unique and it's only offered there, at Poolsville, the global ecology class, which is only offered there. Um, right now, what we do is we say that we make those opportunities available to students who will leave their home schools permanently and become students of the schools that ho house those programs. So are we looking at, at another model that will make those kinds of very interesting courses truly accessible wherever you live and whether or not you're willing to change schools? So that's what I, what I mentioned, that we're, we're exploring a, some signature programming. Now, we, we're not, we can't offer every, every single signature program in the district, but that's what the team is actually exploring right now exactly what you said. What is a signature program that we could pull in to the virtual academy to pilot? Because we have to just be strategic and not doing everything at once. So that, that's what they're discussing. And, and you know, one of the things I also want to mention that, they're, that the team is also working to build out is you know, how do we expand these opportunities after school and in the evening for students as well through online learning. We have online learning pathways that already exist, but how do we build upon that um, to, to take it to the next level? So that's also what is gonna be explored and shared in March 24th. It's like a little preview. <laughs> Coming attractions, yay, thank you. Dr. Dalka. Yeah, I just wanted to support Mr. Cevanini on what he was talking about with changing human resources and doing payroll was a different process. Uh, it does have to be built from inside. It has to match what we do here. We've been through this experience when Dr. Wiest was here, so you know it was a while ago. We bought a program from Canada for uh, student programs for their um, schedules. And when we, we were assured that it would work for the size of our uh, school system and the students, the first day it crashed. And we had students waiting two weeks in order to get changes in their schedules or to even get a schedule. So I, I can't emphasize how important it is that it has to match what we have here. Dr. Tucker, thank you for that feedback. We hear that story every single day in planning to ensure that our systems are, don't do that. Dr. Tucker, I want you to know I was a teacher in the classroom when that happened. I remember. Okay, well, thank you all. Really appreciate it. We're up to chapter eight. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. I would like uh, our director, Seth Adams, for uh, the Department of Facilities Management, and our director, Rachel Du Bois, from the Department of Materials Management, to join us at the table. Good morning. We're going to talk about operations now in our chapter eight. So thank you for having us. Um, operational excellence in MCPS has been and continues to be uh, the expectation and commitment 
to our students, staff, and community as a whole. With this as the cornerstone of our work, the Office of Finance and Operations, newly formed this year, provides high quality business operations and support services essential to the educational success of students by staff committed to implementing equitable practices and continuous improvement strategies. Under the office, we have the following four areas and operations that we'll hone in on today that ensure the, stru the structures and processes of all MCPS business and facilities work together in a coordinated, cohesive, and collaborative manner. Our facilities management under the Department of Facilities Management is committed to the operational performance excellence and continuous improvement with the primary goal to ensure that MCPS facilities meet the needs of all stakeholders. DFM supports student success by providing high quality learning environments through long range planning, design, construction, operations and maintenance, property asset management, and resource conservation and sustainability. Our materials management under the Department of Materials Management economically facilitates the delivery of approved high quality products, meals, resources, and services in the environment of cooperation, integrity, and excellence that is essential to the educational success of all students in MCPS. DMM coordinates the functions and operations of the warehouse and distribution network, instructional and library material processing, editorial graphics, and publishing services, procurement, and food and nutrition services. Our student transportation under the Department of Transportation is responsible for the operation of regular and special ed program bus service for eligible students, vehicle maintenance and repair, employee recruiting and training, and transportation administrative services. Bus operations provide transportation services for more than 100,000 students daily. Ridership is composed of the two categories of regular education and special education. Appeals and transfers. In the operation of work of the appeals and transfers team, we communicate and conduct hearings and appeals related to the change of school assignments. Student discipline, residency, athletic waivers, and complaints from the public are included in this section. This includes working collaboratively with parents, school administrators, and pupil personnel workers and other school and central based staff to implement our processes. In order to define the work for this chapter related to the pie chart before you, we delve more specifically into the comprehensive work being completed each day on the behalf of students and their families. So let's take a deeper dive into the departments. Under the Department of Facilities Management, again, our mission creates uh, to maintain high quality public facilities for a learning through staff dedicated to that excellence and continuous improvement in four areas. Area one. Capital Planning and Real Estate. The Division of Capital Planning and Real Estate developed plans to address the changes in school enrollment and instructional programs through the development of high quality data analysis, planning strategies, and long range facility plans. Enrollment forecasts are developed in alignment with the six year capital improvements program and for long term future projects. The accuracy of the forecast is critical as it is used for resource and staffing allocations, the determination of capital projects, relocatable classroom placements, and by other offices and departments in MCPS that provide instructional programs required for student success. Through a self-supporting entrepreneurial fund, staff in the division also negotiate and manage tenant leases assist with the development of countywide master plans as they pertain to future school sites and inquire and manage future school sites. Revenue is generated through joint tenant, closed school, and telecommunication towers leases used to offset MCPS leased administrative and support space expenditures. Area two, facility design and construction. Facilities, uh, in the facilities of design and construction, processes for major, major capital projects include new schools, additions, 
the replacement and renovation of aging facilities and countywide systemic replacement projects. While the majority of staff and resources for these functions are funded through the capital budget, on time and within budget completions to ensure school openings and operations are critical measures in supporting the strategic priority of professional and operational excellence through creating modern, safe, and nurturing physical environments for students and staff. Area three, building operations and maintenance. Under the Division of Maintenance and Operations, a new unit that was recently forged by merging the Maintenance and School Plant Operations Divisions ensures that our MCPS students and staff are able to learn and work in high quality facilities that are clean, safe, and well-maintained. Facility maintenance and repair, emergency response, and automated building control services are accomplished through maintenance and, and these staff positions. Preventative maintenance, repairs, and facility upgrades are handled by skilled technicians that work out of specialty shops, now housed within our regional service centers. Building service personnel directly support operational excellence by providing services to keep buildings safe and clean. They also support our school's role in the community by assisting with outside use of school facilities by community partners. With an average of 17 to 20,000 square feet of building space under the care of each staff member, building service work is a vital part of keeping our schools and offices running smoothly. Area four, sustainability and environmental compliance under the Division of Sustainability and Compliance. This supports student success by elevating the school system's approach to environmental stewardship and by leading change to incorporate sustainable considerations in all decisions to result in a healthy learning and working environment that are equitably accessible across MCPS. Strategies include engaging students, staff, and local community to address the global sustainability issues at our local level through increased outreach, awareness, engagement, and action towards uh, system-wide improvements in sustainability and environmental compliance. This includes the evaluation and implementation of new strategies to reduce greenhouse gases and waste, to increase carbon, uh, also increased carbon <laughs> sequestration and clean energy utilization. Other strategies will include improved conservation and efficiency, entrepreneurial approaches to energy retrofit improvement projects, continued wholesale energy procurement, and energy cost avoidances. Environmental compliance areas will focus on required management programs for integrated pest management, asbestos, stormwater, wastewater, underground storage tanks, drinking water safety, fire code, and ADA compliance, as well as best practice programs in indoor air quality and radon testing and mitigation. The Department of Transportation. Under the Department of Transportation, our mission provides safe, timely, and efficient transportation that contributes to the educational success of students through, again, committed staff to excellence and continuous improvement. We provide access to education. This occurs in seven areas. Area one, regular education. DOT supports the strategic priority of professional and operational excellence through, again, the daily transportation of 100,000 students on a regular education student bus to neighborhood schools, including Head Start, Magnet, International Baccalaureate, Language Immersion, Consortium, and other programs. DOT's framework for routing and support of consortium schools, allowing students to choose from a variety of magnet programs and match their interest and skills, ensure that our students are challenged, demonstrate progress in the area of interest, and maximize their potential to keep them on track for graduation and post-secondary success. DOT continually evaluates safety and on-time arrival data to improve key performance outcomes. 
Area 2, Special Education Transportation, with a focus on community engagement and wellness and organizational and operational excellence. Approximately 5,000 students are transported daily on special education buses to special education programs. Many students require transportation to specialized programs outside of their home school or require specialized equipment or a bus attendant. DOT fully supports the system of goal, the system's goal of academic excellence for all students by closely monitoring our investment of resources and aligning resources to meet the individual needs of students. DOT is also committed to developing and maintaining partnerships with our parents and schools so that communication among all parents is achieved to support students and family needs. Area three, field trips. Prior to uh, over, I'm sorry, over 14,000 supplemental transportation services are provided on an annual basis for trips and extracurricular activities for instructional programs and to enrich the educational experience for MCPS student on the cost recovery basis. Some of that has changed in the, because of the impact of COVID-19. However, DOT recognizes and supports the importance of the additional learning opportunities by providing these field trips or clubs, sports, which require strong partnership and collaboration with our schools and communities. Student involvement and engagement in the activities contributes to their academic and personal success. Area four, career and technology education, outdoor education and after school activities. Again, are all supported by providing transportation to students to attend various career and technology programs to enhance the educational options for students. DOT cultivates strong partnerships and collaboration with our schools and communities to realize the additional learning opportunities provided by career and technology education outdoor education, and after-school activities. Student involvement and engagement in these activities enhances, again, their academic and personal success. Area five, vehicle maintenance and repair. Focusing on professional and operational excellence, the Fleet Maintenance Unit manages vehicle maintenance, five repair facilities, provides fuel distribution, and is responsible for pairing repairing 1,390 buses and 158 other MCPS vehicles as necessary. Most repair services are provided at the five depot repair facilities and some specialized services are contracted out. Ensuring safe and reliable and on-time service to the over 100,000 students on a daily basis is a key element of ensuring that. Area six are human resources and training. Human resources services managed within the department include advertising and recruiting, hiring, prior employment record checks, drug, assessment, drug testing, safety training, and maintenance of licensing, certification, and medical record assessments. DOT continues to facilitate the rapid deployment of new school bus operators by authorization from the state of Maryland to conduct motor vehicle administration driver record checks and commercial driver's license testing on MCPS premises. The training and employment plan is aimed at employee retention with an overall goal of reducing training and recruiting needs and cost. DOT contributes to the strategic priority of human capital management through the emphasis on professional growth and development. School bus operators and attendant training and retention is facilitated by ongoing cooperative professional growth activities with our SEIU, and we plan to work collaboratively with groups of employees to consider future careers as teachers. Area seven, transportation uh, administrative services. With a focus on teaching and learning again, DOT designs all bus routes and manages employee assignments, planning, staff training, personnel services, accounting, and related services for more than 2,100 permanent and temporary transportation employees. Next, the Department of Material Management in our mission economically facilitates the delivery of approved high quality products, meals, resources, and services in an environment of cooperation, integrity, and excellence that are essential to the education success of all of our students. This occurs within five major functional areas. Area one, supply and property management. D 
TMM manages a warehouse and distribution network that provides the necessary textbooks, classroom and office supplies, science kits, furniture, equipment, and test materials to MCPS schools and offices. An efficient and effective mail service for both internal and external mail is provided. These services support all teaching and learning programs in schools. The DMM warehouse supports and engages the community. It establishes and maintains partnerships with vendors and supports the procurement of materials to support schools and offices. The warehouse and distribution network maintains a laser-like focus in operational effectiveness and a culture of commitment to supporting schools. Supply and property management strives to effectively deliver the resources and services required of all instructional programs. This is accomplished by listening to the needs of customers, having focus groups, understanding requirement expectations, and anticipating needs to formulate strategies to meet the targeted goals aligned with all offices and benchmark practices in the supply chain industry. Area two, instructional and library material processing. DMM maintains a database of approved textbooks and library and instructional materials. It also circulates materials requested by teachers for classroom use. School library media purchases are processed centrally to ensure uniformity, facilitate sy systematic cataloging of records, and save time for school staff. Area three, procurement. The procurement unit purchases goods and services through contract awards to vendors who meet product specifications. The unit monitors vendor performance and product quality to ensure maximum customer satisfaction. Customer service is paramount to providing the resources needed to successfully support instructional programs. The procurement unit works closely with all offices, departments, and the Office of General Counsel to allow for contractors, vendors, and materials to be assessed for students. Maryland state law requires MCPS to advertise for sealed bids for materials, equipment, and supplies that cost more than $25,000. In FY 2010, the state passed a funding accountability law that provides for web-based reporting to the public. Several other jurisdictions have since found, uh, followed with similar information. In addition, the Board of Education has tasked the performance unit with promoting outreach efforts to actively recruit minority, female, and disabled vendors. The procurement unit supports the DMM and MCPS mission and vision strategic goals for providing vendor contracts for schools and offices to purchase high quality goods and services at reasonable costs. The unit follows all procurement protocols and policies, maintains unit objectives, and provides a clear method and process for preferring goods and services for MCPS. Area four, food and nutrition services. The Division of Food and Nutrition Services provides high quality, nutritious meals in a cost effective and efficient operation. The division administers five child nutrition programs, a central production facility, and a food warehouse and distribution center. DFNS serves over 100,000 meals a day to 209 schools, as well as serving and supporting over 300 child and adult care food programs. During the pandemic, uh, DFNS served over 13 million meals that year and normally is serving between 17 and 18 million meals per year. Summer meals are provided to MCPS students enrolled in academic and other programs. The division also provides nutrition education and support to schools and various community groups. This division strives to continually identify through the use of data and prog process review strategies to reach more students in need of food support to improve their opportunities to learn. Area 5, Editorial Graphics and Publishing Services, Copy Plus, Teamworks, and Custom Printing. Editorial Graphics and Publishing Services provides on-demand instructional material, preparation, and delivery services through the Copy Plus program. EGPS maintains the high volume copier system wide and works with copier service partners in schools. It also authors and updates the MCPS correspondence manual, the editorial style book, uh, acronyms guide, and the EGPS website. EGPS produces materials that promote safe learning schools, uh, space in schools and facilities, signage, postage, 
banners, and other products are developed to support the district's public information initiatives. EGPS is data-driven and customer-focused. It operates an apprenticeship program involving MCPS high school students and prioritizes prioritize small work groups to encourage grassroots problem solving. With the information as to the comprehensive work within the operations component of the Office of Finance and Operations, we review the budget pie chart before you. Within the $384.5 million budget, we have 4,485 FTEs with over 5,500 staff members. Thus, uh, the alignment and thus ensuring MCPS providing the highest quality of education and opportunities for all students. As you can see in the pie chart, 58% of the funding goes to salaries and wages. 208 million are positions, 13.4 million are other salaries. This includes substitute bus drivers, substitute bus attendants, and substitutes for building service workers. Under contractual services, we have building rentals. This would be examples of alternative school locations such as Plum Orchard, as well as the Up County Regional Center where some of our DOT special education routing offices reside, as well as 14 and 15 West Goody. Maintenance and operations of 4.6 million can also be for cleaning uh, extensive water main breaks in schools and contractual services to support um, our programs and maintenance and operations. Mm -hmm. Transportation, bus repairs are exactly that. And sometimes uh, they might be outside of our repair shops to have support. Sustainability and compliance is also um, working with meeting compliance under those uh, different sustainability requirements. The enterprise uh, bus camera tickets of 10 million, this is a placeholder and a pass through to the county council for the ticket payments to the police department. The cameras themselves are budget neutral for MCPS. Food services of 1.7 million are our technology services such as WinSnap, which is a tracking system for ordering in items, Newton, a point of sale system, uh, and CACFP, or our uh, tracking system for systems of kid care services with our daycare supports. Under supplies, uh, could you? Yes, thank you so much for the pie chart. Um, supplies and materials of 44.5 million. Food services, 21.6, include such items as disposable flatware, food such as meat, poultry, eggs, and fruit. Maintenance and operations includes uh, for 7.5 million items such as custodial supplies and recycling supplies. Transportation of 11.3 million is bus fuel, but it also includes such items as tires, lubricant, fuel, and parts for buses. Editorial graphics and publishing for 1.6 million, items such as toner, printing parts, cartridges, and other supplies. Other under 67.9 million. Food services, employee benefits of 12.9. Remember, DFNS is a self-supporting enterprise fund, which includes what we are highlighting here, employee benefits, maintenance and operations, continued operations costs for other supplies, relocatables of 4.5 million include new and replaced as well as increased costs. Utilities is the largest within this budget area at $40 million. This is for all schools and offices, and in particular, 27 million in electrical, gas, and sewage. Environmental compliance of 3.1 million. This includes indoor air quality, radon testing and mitigation, asbestos, etc. This is due to the increase of the number of facilities required uh, periodic testing. Transportation insurance meets our insurance requirements. And transportation after school activities of 1.8 million is for after school activity buses. Equipment at 23.2 million. Again, food services, lease, purchase trucks and furniture and equipment replacement. Maintenance vehicles is vehicle lease purchase for maintenance. 
transportation, bus leases of 15 0.5 million. This is lease purchase for diesel buses. We change one twelfth of our fleet each year to maintain the life of the buses and to be able to maintain a large fleet in a cost effective manner. Transportation electronic buses of 3.3 million. This provides for our first round of electric buses and includes 119 buses. I now turn the presentation over to Seth Adams, our Director of Facilities Management. Next slide, please. Uh, good afternoon, President Wolf, members of the board, and Dr. McKnight. I, I will be very brief, um, uh, but, but I know you hear quite a bit from me on the capital budget, but this is an opportunity for me to talk about the facility side of the operating budget. Um, I would say this was a very difficult budget uh, to, to put together, to formulate, to think through. Um, but, but I would say that um, this is also an opportunity for me to say truly how proud I am of, of our supporting services folks, particularly in uh, facilities management, our building service teams who have had to double their workload and, and do innovative things, uh, our, our maintenance teams who um, have, have worked day and night, um, stories of, of people getting in their personal vehicles to go pick up parts and equipment across the state because we couldn't get it here in time for our students. So I just want to take this opportunity and just say, at least for my, for my personal self, how proud I am of this group, um, of how hard they've worked, how, how committed they are to this school system. Uh, and, I, and I think it was just a, a great opportunity for me to bring that to you today. Um, but in terms of, of this budget, um, as, as some of you may know, we have gone through a reorganization. We have tried to modernize, align, our operations with, with where we want to be in the, in the 21st century. Um, that truly is a focus on preventative maintenance. That truly is a focus on, as we start to include sustainable technologies, a focus on training. Um, really this, this idea that we have to, to understand the human capital side of the work that we do on the support side. Uh, certainly you hear quite a bit from the education side. And that, and, and it is equally true in, in our work in terms of how we maintain and, and continue to provide these, these services. So truly appreciate the, the conversations about CT. That is a partnership area that we continue to focus on to see how we can uh, homegrown our, our own students into this, this area of work because we know this is an emergency technology. Uh, we know our current uh, structures do not support where we're headed and and over the next several years this is the first start to that with this budget but you will start to see us uh, changing job descriptions changing um, you know training requirements just really thinking about how we uh, we, we stay with the times of where we're headed as a, as a school district from the support side uh, but I, I truly appreciate the opportunity to to answer any of the questions that you may have um, but but also just want to say a true thank you for, for all your support. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Rachel Boy for discussion on the materials management side. Next slide, please. Thanks, Seth, and good morning to everyone. It's so nice to see you all. Um, I'm about six months into my new position within the Department of Materials Management, coming from the principalship, most recently Bayard Rustin Elementary School, and before that, Piney Branch Elementary School. So it has been a great six months of learning, but taking really the lessons that we all had um, throughout the pandemic and applying it a lot to the work of the Department of Materials Management, it really has changed the work going into this year with the full return to school and just the increase in workload across all departments, really from food to the supplies, the test kits, masks. Um, it's, it's forcing really just that rethinking and reimagining of processes, not just around how we did things last year because COVID was around last year, but here with 100% of our students and staff back in our buildings, what procurement of food items and materials looks like. Um, with, with our buildings at, at our capacity. We really don't have many changes for the Department of Materials Management for this upcoming fiscal year. We are planning to realign two of the full-time operations managers positions back to one full-time materials management operations manager position. That one position had existed for years prior during the pandemic it was created into two positions to support some retirements and main consistency of service. So we're really just returning that back to the position that we had prior. 
By doing that realignment, though, we will have a surplus of around $56,000, and that surplus will support the overall needs of operations. Specifically, it will help support our procurement unit by providing nearly $25,000 to fund the realignment of the procurement unit full-time team leader position to a full-time director position. This realignment will directly meet the department's growing needs. Our procurement unit, as Dr. Dawson had shared, really works through providing vendor contracts for schools and offices for goods and services through across every school department and office. That is a budget neutral um, realignment and a position that had existed prior. And I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Dawson. Thank you. And the other thing I'll highlight too with procurement is when you compare us and benchmark us to other systems, being the largest system in the state, we have one of the smallest procurement units in the state. Uh, and to because we're we're utilizing over 356 million contracts regularly, uh, and we are increasing our vendors and and the different amounts of um, contracts that we're working with, this is an important upgrade for us. This is where we were years ago, and we're trying to bring that back um, to be able to support the increase in our system. So moving on to um, the Department of Transportation, again, we're trying to, we were maintaining realignments in the same um, continuous service budget. So with the realignment of the 1.0 uh, position to the team leader position, again, is this technology upgrade and to begin to set ourselves um, in a place to be able to uh, provide new software, new navigation systems, to be able to look at uh, what Ms. Olini was talking about and um, the software updates, especially for an electronic bus system and be able to better communicate with families. I will say at this point, um, what Mr. Uh, Chiavini had said was um, our anticipation. When we originally about four years ago, maybe I missed four years ago, uh, began looking at routing software, we had brought to the board at that time um, some a, uh, accelerators and we weren't able to get get that work through, um, that was probably a good thing because now with our electronic buses, we want to make sure that we are putting the right software in that would be able to work with electronic buses and diesel buses because we are still in that transformation period. Mm -hmm. So we are currently working to see how we can realign to begin putting out RFPs and vendors for um, for routing system software, because that is something that we want to be able to bring to our community as an upgrade. Um, in the uh, that team leader position, we're looking for that person to be able to do that. We also had um, a realignment from lease purchase of the diesel buses, and that included um, 485,000 uh, from bus fuel and parts. Uh, and this is really for the FY23 year, 119 buses that will be replaced, 61 of which are electric and 58 will be diesel. This is based on our current replacement and transition schedule that I mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. In terms of enrollment growth, so here are 15 positions, um, $811,437, and uh, we're looking at 9.37 bus operators and also uh, 286626 for 10 new routes and 5.625 uh, million for bus attendance and six of the 10 new routes are for special education and four of the new routes are for choice programs. These are added for enrollment growth. We will have 10 new diesel buses based on those 10 new routes. Okay, and um, then we have um, new school spaces. So this area uh, is really 31 positions for custodial supplies, uh, positions and supplies and facility rentals. Uh, Mr. Adams, would you like to add to, to that? I guess just to say that uh, you know this does include new schools. It includes lease spaces. Uh, we've been receiving facilities back from the county, 
facilities that were surplus. So uh, as these numbers increase, certainly we have expectations to, to maintain, to, um, uh, to, to maintain the compliance elements of them, but also you know, the cleanliness and, and upkeep and, and ground. So uh, we certainly have to account for that increase in square footage and, and area as we, uh, uh, as we grow our overall uh, facility inventory. And we don't want to forget our new Gaithersburg um, number eight is in there too. Next slide, please. The Division of Food and Nutrition Services will see oh. some alignments with the F FY23 oh. budget, but not too many. Yeah, but they want more of it because of your search. Is James I'm sorry, I think we have um, uh, another speaker internally. We need to mute. <laughs> okay, we'll continue with um, our enterprise uh, grant shifts of 2.2 positions. Thank you. There were some enterprise and grant shifts to allow for the increase in the budget, really focusing on the increase in allocations for food to reflect the increased prices and demand of food products. Um, that has impacted our work with DFNS and the procurement unit as well, um, as we, you know, experience some of those supply issues with the food that have lessened but are still there. Um, it's requiring us to do some emergency purchases and reach out to vendors, along with our neighboring school systems, of um, you know rethinking some of the sourcing that we are getting for these food food items, but have definitely seen an increase in the food demand and pricing. DFNS does is remain committed to feeding our students a variety of healthy and appealing options. Our menus and recipes are still being created by a team of registered dietitians, nutritionists, wellness supervisors, and our culinary professionals. We're still currently exploring new and exciting options for our student and involves new recipe development and testing on a frequent ongoing basis. Some of the recipes we're working through this year and that we're testing are a Southwest beef and whole grain rice bowl, a vegan teriyaki edamame and whole grain rice bowl, creamy Cajun chicken, chicken and broccoli over whole grain rice, and a creamy chicken pot pie. We have developed vegetarian and vegan choices that are featured on the menu daily. Unfortunately, the pandemic has dramatically changed the way we have been able to operate with both labor and supply shortages. That's both in our central production facility and within our schools. The constraints have impacted the ability to fully implement some of the innovative strategies we anticipated rolling out this year. However, we plan to continue moving forward with the development of these and more concepts. We have collaborated with the award-winning culinary classes from Tacoma Park Middle School and the Real Food for Kids annual culinary competition. Heather Davis, the teacher and chef at TPMS, has led our team to first place in the lunch category for three straight years and is going up for it again um, coming up in March. So we are wishing them the best and we do look forward to adding some of those items to our menu. The winning item from the last competition was a Power Bowl and was included in our secondary menus. We also have our central production facility that's producing our hot pack meals. They produce in-house sauces, soups, salad dressings, and other dishes. Unlike a restaurant or our neighboring school districts, cafeteria systems, our central production facility supports the hundreds of thousands of meals prepared daily. This year, as Dr. Dawson had shared, we are averaging, we have an increase, we're averaging about 150,000 meals a day. We've done on average two meals a month, and this year we have served over 10 million meals to date. So we'll see some realignments, but really not as many changes in that DFNS budget. Thank you. The, the final piece on this slide is realigning the 1.0 building service manager position to fund program supplies under real estate. This is a position that's been vacant. Uh, it was a building service manager two position and it's realigned to program supplies. The Fairland Center is being used as an elementary holding facilities and that uh, they have their own building service manager so that's where it's coming from. Next slide please. So as we look through this slide with rate changes of 2.9 million, um, we have inflation is occurring in all areas and, and it can be up to 25% in, in the areas of supplies and fuels. As a result, the Department of Facilities Management had an increase for facility rentals, uh, facilities rentals of 470,000 and an increase uh, for the relocatables. That is included in this as well of 401. Again, that also um, 
is representative of the inflation prices. So division of the sustainability and compliance for 966,000, an increase in utilities, recycling services, and fire code safety upgrade. Uh, and in particular, um, the recycling services, this was an increase in the contract price. The division of maintenance and operations, 100,000 for increases of monthly preventative maintenance is for elevators. Editorial graphics and printing of 120,000 for uh, purchase of school copiers, repair parts, and again, costs for printing supplies such as copier paper and toner. Those things have also included for publishing materials and printing student workbooks, um, lease maintenance of printing equipment. And we revolve um, every five years. We, we try to be on a replacement schedule for our copiers so that they maintain their quality. We actually have an in-house replacement of parts that we do um, to keep all costs down. And then finally, uh, the Department of Transportation, 624,000 um, for bus fuel based on the projected increase of fuel price and 200,000 for shop equipment as a result of an increase in the cost of equipment. Um, we have eight, within that is 89,000 uh, for additional budget for school activity, um, the EBB buses because our rate change uh, per hour has gone up. Uh, so next slide, and at this time, um, President Wolf, I turn it back to you for discussions and questions. Thank you very much. Please turn your light on if you have a question. Okay, Dr. Joftis. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. Um, thanks for your presentation. Um, just a quick question. Are, are we expecting uh, the federal government to continue providing free meals for next year? First of all, is that still happening? And then are we expecting that to go into next year as well? Okay, uh, thank you for that. Thank you for that question. Yes, currently we are under a waiver. It is called the Seamless Summer Option, and that is until June 30th, so that all students, 18 uh, youth and under, and then students within MCPS that can go up to 21 receive meals for free. Uh, that, that does end on June 30th. We are advocating for universal meals um, federally, um, but in that process, we also have, um, in the past, we have used support for um, our Dine with Dignity program that actually did support uh, the payment of reduced price meals and free meals, meaning students that may have not um, received free and reduced price meal program until a certain point of the year. And if they had accumulated any kind of funding, it was, it was covered in that cost. So those are things we would have to begin exploring, what well, we are exploring again, uh, but we're really seeing what we can do to, to build out that universal component. Is there anything else you wanna add, Rachel? I would just add that you know we are anxiously awaiting an answer on that because as we reach out to schools, we have heard such positive feedback, and I know you all have talked about it of just being able to provide to all students this year. I mean, our staffing and needs have exploded in terms of meal service and just the school-based cafeteria staff has done a phenomenal job in terms of adding you know so many more breakfasts to their meal plans and the, the suppers that they're taking home and the snacks and all of that but beyond some of those staffing explosion needs um, you know we're out of time you know here we are halfway through the school year that we've kind of normed some of these processes and reaching out to principals and who've also supported us in getting kids you know effectively through the lunch line I mean we have in some of our schools five lunches a day and so things are moving at a very fast pace but everyone has been so supportive and encouraging and also talking through um, just just how it feels to kids that so many more kids are going through that lunch line and providing. So just internally, along with the director, Barbara Harrell, Food and Nutrition Services, working with our leadership teams and school-based staff to talk through what are some options and which way things could go and how do we plan um, just our staffing and approaches and, and kind of planning for both, both options and both scenarios, not knowing just yet. At a, at a very high level, how does that, how is that sort of a, that uncertainty, I guess, how does that play out in the budget in terms of how you 
budget for something you're not sure whether we're going to get the federal funds for, et cetera, et cetera? Yes, again, um, very good question. So with with the amount of um, cost, we get reimbursement federally for for food, uh, and again, it's a it's an enterprise fund, so it is the DFNS is self supporting. Uh, also, uh, through those reimbursements, through offering a la carte, um, those are ways that we can continue programming. But we would need to consider putting. Um, you know, money aside, uh, and you can't necessarily do that. It has to, um, in the past, we have gone over budget um, when we were working with Dime, the Dime with Dignity Fund. So that's where we come together and we work with the board and um, the foundation program to to see where we can support each other in, those, in that fund. Thank you. Ms. Harris. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, first, so first, I just want to give a shout out to um, Copy Plus. The, that's such a great service to our staff every year, and that acronyms guide is so very helpful. Um, you know, people don't know about it till they know about it, and they really appreciate it. Um, and um, now, um, and thank you. I'm going to say thank you to Mr. Adams for really highlighting that tie-in between our Grow Your Own and the, all the mission-critical work that happens in facilities that a lot of people don't think about when they think about working for a school system. You don't really think about, you know, um, being, you know, a, an environmental specialist. But I mean, all of that work is so essential. Um, so a question I have is, as we are looking at the way we're evolving and transforming. Our buildings, serve, our buildings, and so our building services staff are needing to um, do new work around um, maintaining, operating, and servicing our indoor air quality units, our water bottle filling stations, using the new um, work order, you know, management system. Does this, our, does our operating budget, are we really taking into account the? Um, professional development that we need to make sure our building services staff have the, the training that we need so that the work we expect them to do, they are really ready to do. And that, that is a fantastic question. Um, one of the things that we have done this year as part of a reorganization is we have, uh, uh, we, we have pulled uh, what used to be plant equipment operators from our secondary schools. Uh, they're now converted to preventative maintenance technicians, and they, they report to, obviously, their existing uh, middle or high school, but also support all the elementary schools as well in their cluster. Uh, so prior to doing that, and that was a direct response of maintaining the filters and, and uh, everything from belts to um, water filters, you, you name it, uh, we did have a robust internal training session to make sure uh, you know, all those individuals were up to speed. But since they were plant equipment operators previously, they had much of that training to begin with. So as we think about next steps within this budget, we have put in uh, additional building service supports at particularly at the middle schools to assist in, in lunchtime. We, we did hear from our schools that by pulling um, some of those folks out of the middle schools, it was a little more difficult to manage lunch. So within this budget request, we are asking for additional building service support in there. But a great question about training, and training is not something that we stop. That is something that will continue to grow. Uh, but as it stands today, a majority, if not 90 plus percent, is internal training uh, that we formulate and, and distribute through our existing staff. And, and the next question is uh, somewhat similar when we look at transportation. Could, could you all remind us of the timeline for fully transforming our bus fleet from diesel to electric? And so when we look at this and you're looking at how you're already working to realign the budget to as that transformation occurs, because the, the maintenance is different, certainly the fuel, we don't need that anymore. And the, the, so are we thinking that big picture, the costs of our 
transportation infrastructure will simply sort of stay the same as, you know, right now we spend, what, about $8 million or so dollars a year just on fuel. So when we don't need that anymore, are we thinking that will be, we'll realize that as savings in the system, or do the needs of operating and supporting a diesel, uh, excuse me, an electric fleet equal that out? Good question. Uh, we will be saving money uh, definitely through the fuel, and we, we should be saving some. However, we will be saving money. However, we don't know the full effects of the electronic systems yet. Uh, the, in, in riding the electronic bus, it is one of the most, and we'll have to do a tour for the board, it is one of the most fabulous things I've ever seen. They're quiet, they are, they are extremely safe, they have every possible thing there that uh, with all the intelligence of those systems uh, to consider. I, I know up front that we're saving money by doing this, but the long-term effect of once we com complete the fleet, we continue to do our own management uh, in terms of maintenance. We, we will do all of the, the fleet maintenance with the exception of the high voltage of the batteries. That is not something that will be turned over to us. There are mechanics that have to come in to do that. Uh, but other than that, we are doing the internal maintenance ourselves. So we're expecting cost savings. And when you, we mentioned that's another thing too, looking at our current maintenance staff, vehicle maintenance staff, are we, um, what's the plan around as their work transforms? Um, keeping yes. continuously so, training them, so hopefully connecting with our automotive CTE programs. Yes, yeah, so I love the idea. Um, so the training uh, we currently are doing with our staff, our fleet, our fleet uh, maintenance, and our building, I mean our uh, operations, our bus operators, is going on currently. We're training them differently because they have to drive the buses a little differently. Uh, the uh, maintenance fleet uh, they have to do uh, their all of their, um, I guess the just just the in repairs and things are similar yet different. So they are getting trained on all of that. However, incorporating uh, certainly our students in the automotive and tech groups will be fantastic. They will just love every second of seeing those kinds of things. So again, making those connections for our students is, is very important. Just like we've done with um, editorial graphics, building in, uh, working with our high school students and internships, you know, those are opportunities uh, that we can really move and we've talked about through all of um, facilities and operations is you know, being better about trying to create those those opportunities for students. Thank you. And the, my last question, and I'm just going to ask an overview question because I'm guessing Ms. Uluni is going to have some specific questions about this, but the food. So we've all heard many, many, many things about the, the you know, quality of the food, and that's not new. It's rather longstanding. So looking at, um, uh, Ms. Dubois, you were mentioning some of the really great work that I know has happened at Tacoma Park Middle School, and I think that's why we see some really great student advocates coming out of Piney Branch and Tacoma Park around how do we make our, our operations more sustainable and how do we make the food more, you know, looking at local and grow your own and, um, you know, healthier, tastier options. And so the, the programs that you mentioned with Real Food for Kids and those have been going on. So do we have a plan to scale that a little bit more rapidly given all of the comments we've been hearing about food, you know, those partnerships where students are actually helping to develop and taste test and those menus. It's hard for me to exactly say with this with this year. Um, we've gotten to a place where menus are not exactly changing day to day, but sourcing of the products has been incredibly difficult this year. A lot of the Power Bowl menu items that we have, you'll see um, 
are maybe not on the secondary menus, but they're arriving in the schools depending on the availability of the product. In terms of the um, central office leadership team and formulating some of those focus groups and testing, we're rolling out some plans to do some testing back in the spring in the schools, um, now that we've kind of gotten through halfway through this year and developing products. We also have a wellness supervisor trying to rethink how we reach kids virtually as well. You know, in the past, this has all been in person and people coming to the cafeteria and eating the food, um, trying to think through, you know, with masks off and things like that, how you know viable of an option will this be this year? So the wellness supervisor has created just a series of videos of, um, you know, roasting vegetables, the life of a hot pack, um, things that are kid friendly that, to be able to roll out to some of our focus groups and do um, explore some of the Zoom options for getting some feedback back to schools. Um, and then just some plans for education around the food items, right, and how they meet our daily nutrition guidelines and how we work with our menus and just, yes, planning on upgrading a lot of those things. Um, bringing back a smoothie line that we have, but you know, just in terms of this year, we started in a place where the menus were changing daily or the orders that were showing up you know, in the trucks were shorted or the wrong thing was subbed out. So we feel more confident at this point in the year to have some consistent menuing of those, of those products and we'll continue the plan with the focus groups and things like that. Thank you. But there's been a lot of challenges with that, absolutely. Ms. Mandrowski. Thank you. I'll be quick. Um, I too want to uh, thank Mr. Adams for his appreciation, showing his appreciation for all of the work that our staff have been doing, particularly with all of the new challenges, trying to maintain COVID situation and all that. So thank you. Um, I was going to bring up the building services support, but you touched on that. I'm assuming because you knew it was coming, but because um, <laughs> we've been talking about that a lot. Um, so my only other real question um, for right now is in terms of the transportation, um, I'm, I guess I wasn't, I was unclear, two things. I was unclear about the, with the 10 new buses to support the result of moving schools to holding facilities, does that include part of the te program of new bu electric buses that we're buying? Is, so. In, so the, we're replacing buses with electric buses, and I wasn't sure, are we moving bus, like, in other words, are we reusing, or are we just? Um, we have, um, I think I understand your question. So uh, we have 10 new routes, mm -hmm. and uh, six of those are for special education, four for choice routes. So the routes themselves are the growth of schools um, and how we're, whether we put a, a diesel bus there or whether we put an electronic bus there, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, but we'd like to be able to highlight, um, highlight those things. It's mainly just making sure that we're able to increase our numbers of staff for, for the routing system and be able to make sure that, again, that we have enough bus drivers to, to add all of these routes for our schools. And the holding facilities in particular, because those routes changed. Yeah. Um, and our new school, I'm sorry. I, I figured that, but I was mostly, that's mostly walkers, I guess, so um, probably don't need too much there. But I'm just, I'm very concerned about ensuring that we have enough transportation so that everyone can participate in the learning hubs with transportation to them um, as much as possible and for after school activities and things like that, because I know a lot of families, if they, don't have the transportation provided, they can't participate, um, including our special education students. Um, and then the last question I have is, um, Mr. Adams, if you could just speak to the realigning of the one building service manager position to fund program supplies under real estate management. What, what, is, what, what program supplies do you need under real estate management? So. I, I think that one is is maybe a little misleading because we are asking for additional building service su supports throughout the county, but there there was a specific building service manager at a facility that that we no longer need. Um, we're using that that position, uh, which theoretically we could have just transitioned it somewhere else and used something else. But I think you know again for the purposes of balancing this budget, we're using that position to be able to fund the additional green 
green cleaning supplies and additional filters and, and some of those things. I would point out that you know the ESSER funding for filters and, and you know some of our green cleaning has been there, but this is the first budget. We have to start thinking about those added costs. A few years ago, it was double because we had already purchased filters and those sorts of things, so the costs were, were significantly higher. But with the higher efficiency filters and the different cleaning supplies, it is going to be more than what we historically saw pre-pandemic. So we, we are looking for ways to balance the budget, but, but to fund those uh, increases. And this was certainly uh, you know, one of the, the options that, that we put forth to do so. Okay, because I wasn't sure if you were looking at, still looking at considering contracting out to companies that can come in and do like that blue lighting stuff or if we're, we're doing that. I, I was just, the reason I'm asking about it specifically is because of your initiative to help the sustainability um, process with, you know, the change in the policy that we just um, put out for public comment, um, ensuring that you have the funding necessary to make those kind of changes that might need to be made to support that work? I, I would say, de obviously, depending on the final resolution of that policy, um, we, we could see very, very significant changes in, in this particular budget next year. Um, so we, we certainly um, were accounting for some of our own sustainability initiatives that, that we're currently working through now. Uh, but I think you know the, the, the work that we've talked about from the policy could be much more significant, and, and we could see many more changes next year this time when we're speaking to it. But, but for, for now, we are looking at um, you know, really just the existing sustainability concepts and, and approaches that we've had. Um, in terms of contracting, yes, we've, we've looked at opportunities. Um, you know, again, we, we, uh, we have not experienced the same um, staffing challenges as, as transportation, but we have had challenges. Um, and we've floated the idea of, of possibly having supports in, in contractual services, but predominantly in this budget, the contractual services are more for mechanical systems. So our, 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 our winter boiler work, our summer you know, chiller work, those sorts of things that are becoming more and more and more complex, we are relying more and more on our uh, you know, contracting partners to be able to be successful in those endeavors. Okay, thank you. Ms. Evans. Sure, thank you. Um, so actually the question that I was going to ask Ms. Harris asked it around food services and food quality and what we were going to be doing in the future of um, making use of our universal um, meal program. So you answer that. But I think one thing I just want to say is um, Mr. Adams just made me think about, uh, you know, some of the, you know, the comments that we, that he made about, um, and we're going to be talking about it on February 14th, about how we're using, you know, laying out ESSER funding, blueprint funding, and we think about how we need to begin thinking about some of the items that we need that we're going to budget for. It just, it's going to be even more important how we use our money going forward, being that this is the same services budget, right? So I'm sure it's really hard for you all to come and sit here and say, <laughs> We're doing the same service budget, right? But we know in light of our current situation, um, we're, we're trying to, uh, I don't know what word I'm using, I want to use, but I know it's very difficult to, to come here and act like, I've, I've heard people talk about the increase in workload and everything and to act as though we don't need more because we, we do, right? So it'll be really important how we're talking about all these additional items that we need to do, that we want to continue to do, and think about some additional things that we have not done in our current budget that will also need to be done as well. So I just wanted to say that. So I do feel um, as though you all might think that we are not aware of what we need, but we are, right? And so that doesn't mean that board members won't come and have amendments, but we'll also be mindful that whatever we bring forward, that means there's something else that we won't be able to do. So it's just really tough. The pandemic has really, really been tough. And I don't know that um, people quite get how challenging this is for not just Montgomery County, but school districts all across the country. So I just wanted to say that. Um, we hear you, we know. We know what's going on. We hear it from teachers, from principals, from parents. I'm a parent as well. 
right? So I'm not able to go into the school, but I'm able to get those emails, right? Um, I see what's going on in the system. So I just wanted to say that. I feel like that's the elephant in the room, that you all come here, you sit and you present as though everything is just as you need, you know? And, and so I just wanted to say that. But just thank you to everyone that's come before us in the previous work sessions, everyone here today, our budget team for all the hard work, because this is not easy. This is not easy. And um, I just wanted to say that before we go into recess. Ms. Aluni. Yeah, I just wanted to continue uh, Dr. Joftis's line of questioning about our universal school meals. I know that's something I've brought up a number of times at the board table. I know that we have a pilot program at a few of our uh, highest need elementary schools where we're experimenting with those universally free school meals. Are we monitoring not just the data of how many additional meals are being bought? Because we know from this district-wide pilot, if you will, of this year, that we do indeed, as was stated during the presentation, have lots more meals consumed this year than others. But also at student achievement data, after uh, the Universal School Meals Program was implemented, I would be really interested in that, especially since we know that many of our undocumented students often don't fill out the free and reduced meals program, right? And now that they are able to afford and access meals, I'm sure, or I assume, um, that that has had an impact on student achievement. So um, if we could just get that as a follow-up, I would really appreciate um, looking at that achievement data of those schools that have done that. Um, as well as, and I asked for this before, um, but a cost projection on what it would cost for our school system to absorb the cost of continuing, if we want to talk about same services, the same service of having free meals for everyone that we have this year available next year. And I know it's going to be a lot, and I know we're pushing our federal government to, to continue reimbursements for us, um, but to be honest, I don't know how quickly they're going to act. So if we could get those follow-ups. Yes, we can, and we'll bring um, the cost on Tuesday. Oh, perfect, okay. wonderful. Um, the other thing, I have visited over 60 schools this school year, and I always do it during their lunch period. I like to eat lunch with students, walk around the hall, speak with students who aren't necessarily super engaged with our school system. Um, and because it's during lunch, as Ms. Harris said, the questions I often get the most are about lunch. And one issue of particular concern for our students this year is the fact that we don't have water bottles. <laughs> Dr. Dahl said, I know we've talked about this before, we don't have water bottles uh, served in our cafeteria anymore. And I know this is part of a long-term plan to switch our school district to those reusable water bottle filling stations and get those, get our old stations swapped with the reusable bottle filling station everywhere. But um, we still, I mean, students just aren't, staying hydrated as they could when they had water available. Um, so that would be something that I would be interested in. I mean, I'm assuming, because this is same services, water is not part of our food budget for this budget. Yes? Yes, we have actually, um, the water bottles are being uh, provided through ESSER funding because in normally, we have an eight ounce for our elementary and a 16 ounce for our um, high school students. Mm -hmm. And they have multiple options at lunch. However, because uh, of the changes to uh, the menus, we wanted to make sure that all schools had the opportunity to provide water. So I don't know if you wanted to add anything on to that, but I'm, I'm not sure why we have communicated that. <laughs> We're going to work with our, our supervisors and just the ongoing communication between the cafeteria staff and school staff. Since we are using the ESSER funding for the water bottles, we are accounting for how many water bottles we're purchasing. So the 16 ounce waters for the secondary schools are being ordered for, from a vendor. So the distributor delivers them and directs ships to schools. Um, they do need to be ordered for the, from the cafeteria manager. As the DFNS Enterprise Fund is tracking the orders, the manager does need to put the order in for the water. The eight ounce waters get delivered to the food service warehouse. So they are delivered from food service staff so we'll continue and follow up on those conversations but it does need to be ordered through the cafeteria manager and then we're tracking through just how we're spending that SR money on the water bottles but I agree I think there's been a just you know, just 
depends. We have some schools that are out ordering nonstop and then others um, that haven't. So we'll continue to share that information. Absolutely. Making sure we have the room in our operating budget to absorb that as well, because if it's ESSER funding, we want to make sure that kids can yeah, continue to get that. Absolutely. Yes, that would be something that we would have to convert. Yeah, just making sure that we're continuing the communication with those um, cafeteria managers would be great. Last thing, super quick, um, I know, Dr. Dawson, you briefly discussed the RFP that's out for our um, new routing software for the school system. Um, is part of that, is included in that RFP um, also uh, a request for the bus tracking app? Are those together or is it that separate? So we have not put out an RFP yet. Okay. Yeah, so when we were talking, we have not put an RFP out yet. Uh, and that would, we would want to include that as well um, so that there is an app that can go with that so that it's a combination. The reason, again, is because we want to take the time to ensure that we're able to use it on all buses uh, and make sure that it fits the specs for all of our buses because we are in our transition time over the next several years to get those buses. So we want to make it right. So that's something we will work with and we'll be able to come back on too. And, we'll just be and have a better idea of pricing once we put that out on the street. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to confirm that it was going to be a separate RFP, but I appreciate that. And I do expect, just, just a, uh, assuming that the price has gone down from what we originally assumed, I think, four years ago. But thank you. Okay, thank you. Terrific presentation. Very detailed. I appreciate it. And thank you for thanking all of our workers who have had a rough year so far. They're into their second rough year, and we, we may be going further, but thank you. At this time, we'll take a 30-minute break and return at 1.30.
down to chapter nine. You want to get started? Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, we'll start with um, the chapter nine on finance, and I'm going to introduce um, Rob Riley, our associate superintendent of finance. Can we get the slides up? Good afternoon, President Wolf, Dr. McKnight, and fellow board members. The Office of Finance facilitates the alignment of the district strategic priorities with financial resources that result in MCPS providing the highest quality education and opportunities for all students to succeed. Work of the office includes budget development with a budget unit led by Ms. Alfonso uh, Windsor, um, works with the superintendent, the board, MCPS staff, and a comprehensive group of community and governmental stakeholders to project revenues and determine the expenses required to meet the needs of MCPS students and the strategic priorities of academic excellence, well-being and family engagement, and professional and operational excellence. Following budget approval, the school and financial operations team, overseen by Ms. Diane Gomez, works closely with all the OTLS directors and schools to implement the budget and to allocate resources to schools, students, and programs based on school requirements. The team collaborates with stakeholders to ensure that the guidelines for allocations are aligned with system priorities and are differentiated to meet student needs. After the budget is developed, approved, and allocated, funds are available for the thousands of various financial tra transactions that take place during the course of the year. The Division of Controller, led by Ms. Susan Chen, works with MCPS offices and schools to fulfill the accounting requirements of our various school financial systems, including the hub and the P-card module. The division makes sure that our revenues are collected and properly recorded, and that all of our vendors are paid timely and accurately. The Department of Employee and Retiree Services, known as ERSKI, is under the direction of Ms. Gina Ripoli. They make sure that our staff is paid timely and accurately. In addition to administering payroll, ERSKI also serves as a single point of contact for employees and retirees for information on compensation and benefits. One of these benefits is our retirement plan. The Division of Investments under Ms. Phoebe Kwan works with the Board of Investment Trustees in overseeing our $2.3 billion defined benefit pension plan. The pension fund is actually a separate fund outside of the operating fund, but the employer contributions to the pension fund are one of the expenditures that are paid out of Chapter 9. In addition to assisting in the development of a budget that reflects the board's strategic priorities, the Office of Finance is also responsible for monitoring the actual spending relative to the budget. This process we, we call uh, financial monitoring, and it's facilitated by the budget specialists that work with fiscal agents throughout the system to make sure that the spending stays within the budget. This year, that process includes the monitoring of our ESSER funding and the budget to actual status of our operating fund. Our ESSER funds and the operating fund can be seen in the mon monthly financial report that is provided to the board. Also, as noted in previous work sessions, the details of ESSER spending will also be presented in future board meetings. Financial monitoring is not only a valuable internal control, but also is a tool to make sure we meet our targeted year-end fund balance. The responsibility for year-end reporting of the operating fund, the pension fund, the employee benefit fund, and seven other unique funds of MCPS falls under the Division of Financial Services led by Mr. Daniel Kelly. This division also produces our annual comprehensive financial report, oversees the annual audit, and is currently working with FEMA on some COVID expense reimbursements. Other work of the office includes maintaining and updating the financial manual, which documents the variety of financial practices and procedures for the district, and collaborating with the Office of Technology and Support and Infrastructure in the implementation of our school cash online software and the upcoming HCM upgrade project, along with OHRD. Uh, what you see on the screen is the object of expenditures of Chapter 9, and it's different than all the other chapters because the bulk of the expenditures fall under the object of other expenses. This is because the Office of Finance is responsible for the payment of benefits for all of the other chapters in the budget. The employer portion of the pension benefit for FY23 is $128.3 million. The employer payroll-related benefits, mainly FICA taxes, are $155.5 million. And the largest ex employer expense for benefits 
is that of our health benefit plans for active and retirees, and that totals $336 million in FY23. Another unique line item that you'll see on this pie chart is expenditures for future supported projects. This term will be familiar to you because it appears on many board agenda consent items, and the total amount for FY23 remains at $10.3 million. The provision for future supported project is, is a lump sum appropriation that allows the board, under certain conditions, to approve the receipt and expenditure of unanticipated grant funds throughout the year rather than having to request supplemental appropriations from the county council. It has no impact on the tax supported budget. The tax supported budget excludes revenues from enterprise funds, special revenue funds, and grants. Next slide, please. Significant budget changes in this chapter all relate to the adjustments to system-wide benefits that relate to changes in staffing levels. For instance, as we've mentioned previously, our decrease in student enrollment has led to a decrease in 113 positions, which equates to $1.8 million. Conversely, FY23 will also have a new school and new space that results in an increase of 61 positions and $963,000. The most significant budget change in this chapter is the need for $41 million that are associated with the employer portion increase in our health benefit plan. About 11 million of this increase represents the benefits associated with the negotiated salary increases for staff. The other 30 million is the increase requi required to bring our employee benefit plan to a sustainable balance. As noted before, the employee benefit plan is actually a separate fund, but the largest funding source for that fund is the MCPS employer contribution, which is paid out of the operating fund. Our healthcare consultants have been projecting increase in expenditures in the EBP plan, mostly due to deferred medical procedures of plan members as a result of the pandemic, and also a result of uh, increasing claim and premium rates. Starting in the middle of the last fiscal year, these projections have come to fruition, and we have seen our once $60 million EBP fund balance drop more than half. By the end of next year, without the $30 million addition, the combined fund balance would risk being depleted. Since it is our first class employee benefit plan that distinguishes and sets MCPS apart from other employers competing for a limited number of employee candidates, it's paramount that we maintain this fund to attract and retain a highly qualified staff for our students' success, and as such is one of the key investments in this budget. That concludes my overview of Chapter 9, and I'd like to pass to you, President Wolf, for any questions from the board. Thank you. Please turn your light on if you have any questions. Ms. Mandrowski? I just have one, and I apologize. You may have stated it in the beginning, but this, so you're talking about the um, employee growth, the salaries, wages, and health benefits and things like that. Um, this is inclusive of the uh, pay increases that we've been discussing? Uh, the, the benefits related to that, not the, the actual pay increases. They're going to be in uh, Chapter 1. Okay. Thank you. Right, and eventually we'll get distributed. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you. I think we're up to Chapter 10. Yes, now we'll have um, Dr. Helen Nixon, who is our Chief of Human Resources and Development. Thank you. Good afternoon, President Wolf, Vice President Silvestri, Dr. McKnight, and members of the school board. I appreciate the opportunity to share the OHRD budget with you this afternoon. I would like to acknowledge and thank our team members in budget and finance for helping OHRD to put this documentation together for us. I am joined by my team via Zoom, um, Dr. Marjorie Lope Mutsatso's Assistant Chief Professional Development and Learning, um, Dr. Yolanda Stanislaus, Director of DPGS, Ms. Michael Simmons, Director of Department of Compliance and Investigation, and Mr. Travis Wiebe, Certification and Staffing Director. So they are on Zoom visiting with us today. Next slide, please. Oh, thank you. Our, OR, uh, our OHRD work places an emphasis on recruiting and retaining all positions in MCPS as we continue to cultivate our brand as a destination employer. By ensuring all staff members can see the trajectory of their career in MCPS and are confident that the professional development and professional learning opportunities that we have 
are an investment in them. We have our creation of our EAP to make certain that our employees have an opportunity to focus on their wellness and well-being. As we look at the work of OHRD as an integral part of touching all the lives across the offices, we build a diverse workforce partnering with our equity office to ensure that what we do in OHRD is equitable and inclusive, and we investigate opportunities for continuous learning and professional development. We support all of our new employees through coaching, mentoring, induction, and onboarding. And last but not least, we ensure through our compliance and investigations team that our practices and our work sites are safe for all students. I do want to add one thing before we dive into looking at our chart, and that is on February the 8th, OHRD will be coming back to the Board of Education to give you a progress check on our last presentation to you in November, where we will be giving you an update on our strategic recruiting, on our substitute teachers and professional development, our Grow Your Own and University partnerships, and something that you heard a little bit about today, the Pathways Program, for future of work and partnerships. And Dr. Daka, if I may just take a moment, I just wanted to address something that you brought up in your comments earlier about Howard University. I want just to assure you that we have been to Howard. Um, our team did present to Dr. January Vance. She actually on November the 10th sent us a very lovely thank you note with, uh, with the sentiment that she looks forward to our, our, our partnership in the future. So I just wanted to let you know that we have that. And on February 8th, we will be featuring um, our visit to Howard University. Good, thank just you. Just wanted to share that with we've, you. We've heard from a lot of uh, people that we really needed to have a, a relationship with Howard. So thank you. Yes, absolutely. So as you can see on the chart before you, we are presenting a same services budget in OHRD. Our total budget is $20.5 million. In the graph, you will note that the largest section of 71% of our budget is dedicated to salaries and wages at, at $14.5 million. Additionally, our contractual services at $0.3 million. And an example of a contractual service for us is our hybrid EAP model, um, the contract that we have with Kepro. That's an example of one of our contractual services. Additionally, under this, we have our supplies and materials, program supplies, training supplies, and office supplies across the offices. And an example of perhaps program supplies would be our um, materials for our CPD courses, training supplies could be the training manuals that we use, um, the certificates that we print for retirees and for completion of, of different coursework as well, and of course office supplies. In our category of other, for $5.45 million, we have tuition reimbursement, which was um, a question that we had earlier about how our employees submit and or what is eligible for the submission of tuition reimbursement for professional development for continuing education courses that they take. And they work very closely with our tuition reimbursement office um, and our supervisors to make sure that whatever those uh, courses are, are appropriate and are re reimbursable. We have our grants benefits, for example, the Title IIA grant, consulting teacher salary and benefits, our university partnerships, which include uh, tuition reimbursement for $0.35 million, and our non-public training support grant, and this is the professional development that we must provide to our non-public schools. And then, of course, we've got staff training and travel, uh, which speaks to professional conferences, recruitment trips. Um, NEO training and various other teacher uh, stipends and participations for, for training throughout the year. Next slide, please. One of the first changes to note that we are bringing forward is we are asking for a name change for the Department of Certification and Staffing. We would like to rename that department uh, the Department of Human Capital Management so that it is more representative and inclusive of the work that that office does. And it would mirror what we have captured in our, our budget book as well, and it, it makes it and brings it all into alignment. 
Uh, the, next, the next item here, as you will see, is we've got position reconstitution to create a 2.0 staffing assistant position in the Department of Human Capital Management to support the hiring of supporting services positions during this critical time. The reconstitution also results in a 1.0 secretary position to assist in our employee assistance unit. In both of these areas, as we have noted through many of the public comments and things that have been shared with the board all year about the, necessary, uh, the necessity for hiring of positions, being able to expedite the hiring process, and being able to sp support our EAP office, these reconstitutions were critical to make sure that we could meet those needs for the hiring and certainly in support of our EAP office. We have also um, have a 1.0 specialist position realigned to a human capital metrics and process improvement coordinator. Um, this realignment is really about getting us ready to support all of the work of our new ERP system. The other thing that we know is that of great interest to our school board is making sure that we understand what our return on investments are, that we are really paying close attention to the metrics that we need to be able to report out on, and so this realignment allows us to do just that. We also have funds that have been realigned from supporting services, part-time salaries, and other program costs to create a 2.0 staffing assistant two position and a fiscal assistant to meet the processing requirements of our new hires due to the compliance that we must have with House Bill 486. We've had TPT that have been supporting this effort over the last few years, and so we had to make those full-time positions because of the compliance issues with House Bill 486. And our fiscal needs in the Office of Human Resources and Development, as we continue to um, grow our tuition reimbursement responsibilities and uh, to be in compliance with future forward work around the Maryland blueprint and with the professional development, it was very important to get that extra support in for the fiscal assistance. So that is, that we have two slides. Those were our two, our two OHRD <laughs> slides. So the rest of our time is dedicated to your questions. Please turn your light on, Ms. Harris. Yes, yeah, thank you. And I very much look forward to the presentation on yes. February 8th. That'll be interesting. Yes. Because I, I think I've been doing some reading on the uh, hiring and education and career pathways. And it, I think, you know, we have, as we all know, kind of three issues. One, just a shortage of people out there to fill the jobs that we have. Two, a lack of young people actually going into some of these career fields and how do we entice them to see that that is a vision for their future. And then I think the, the last thing is people come in and then they don't stay very long. But I think too, the more I'm reading, it's, it, it seems it's almost a generational thing that in Gen X, Gen Y, they may stay in a career, but they change jobs a lot. So how we do that destination that makes people want to stay for a long time. I'm, that, I'm really interested to see what you're thinking about that. Um, and I did have a question. When you said on slide 23, um, the second bullet, um, reconstituting to create two staffing assistant positions in part to support the hiring of supporting services positions, does that include supporting services positions, does that include substitute teachers? So that, that includes everything. So when we have supporting services, what we've been able to do is leverage those new assistants to help us with the expediting of all of the applications that are coming in to help support that. Okay. And then um, your fourth bullet on that slide, um, could you just talk a little bit about, so we're um, relining and we're creating two staffing assistant positions and a fiscal assistant position to meet the processing requirements related to HB 486. Can you just talk a little bit about how those folks are going to be working together to help expedite that process? Because I know well-intended piece of legislation, unintended consequences. Yes. Great. Thank you. So for the first uh, question and comment that you had regarding the retention pieces, so when we come in, uh, on February 8th to talk about our future of work, we will talk about the comprehensive work group that we've had where we looked at what some of those key touch points are 
based on the feedback from a, a diverse group of, of SEIU members, um, administrators, who have really talked to us about what they see and what they hear for them employees in terms of what they need to make sure that they want to stay with us, the things that they need to hear, the opportunities that they would like to know more about. And what's so critically important is that our responsibility to our employees is to help them to see the way in which they can cultivate their career here with us. So, and, and as we get folks from point A to point B, it creates other entry level positions for us as well. But what it demonstrates to our workforce is that as we get you and as we invest in you and as we help you to see that your career can be a 20, 25, 30 year career investment here, it's, it's putting that infrastructure in place so that our employees see that. It's helping them to see what that vision is. And I think part of this future of work that we have been uh, putting together and are very excited to bring you in, in February really demonstrates what that timeline looks like and um, what, those, what the touch points are going to have to be for people to know who do I talk to, what courses do I take, how am I supported financially, and how can I actually see myself growing in this role? And where are those financial touch points? Because what we, what we know that we hear from our employees is that opportunity for financial security and for you know, financial wellness into the future is really an important part of it. It's not all of it, but it's an important part of it. So compensation is, is definitely key. But the other thing too is we have heard from our employees that they want to upskill, they want to have greater skills, they want to be ready for those future positions. Uh, and, and one thing, Ms. Harris, that, that this work group is going to continue to focus on is we know that there are certain positions that are evolving, that a skill set that I have today may be outdated in one or two years. We have to be very proactive in the way that we think about what those future jobs are so that if I have you in this position now and we see that things are changing, how can we make those predictions? And then how can we have that employee ready to meet that demand? And so that's, that's part of what's been so exciting about participating in this work group is, is seeing that those pathways have a very long runway and we're building it together um, with, with this very diverse work group. In terms of the House bill, so uh, what I can share with you is that the House bill, for those of you who are new or, or, or may not know the background of it, it requires school employers um, to conduct employment review of each person hired into a new position within the first 60 days of employment. And the review includes requesting, reviewing, and following up on feedback from former employers specific to child abuse and sexual misconduct, as well as a review of the new employee's state and national certification status. So the level of scrutiny that, that House Bill requires, uh, we needed to have full-time folks dedicated to this because it is very painstaking and a, a very obviously worthwhile effort and endeavor because what is most important to us is the safety and security of our, of our students. So with House Bill 486, it has added this extra layer of, of background checking, and that's, that's where we have needed to, to kind of bolster and fortify the way that we do that and process it so that our new employees can move swimmingly kind of through that process. Yeah, thank you. And it is, it'll be interesting looking forward again to the 8th because I think there's been a generational culture shift in what it, people perceive a career to be. Yes. And so, yeah. Yes. And, and also, you know, you may start out in, in, in a position and, and end up somewhere where you never thought possible in the system. So, for example, someone, you know, who may start out in building services uh, ends, up, uh, ends up a teacher. It's, it really is about building relationships. It's about the building leader, the supervisor, having these conversations. What can I do? How can I help you? Helping people to identify their talents. You're really great at this. Let's build this together. Where do you see yourself? I think people really need those kinds of conversations and that's what this Pathways is really about. It's building and cultivating those relationships 
and that retention and that investment is helping you to see you can have a diverse career in MCPS as well as a long one. Awesome. Thank you so much. I have a follow up and you, you wanted to follow up. Should I let you go first? Come on. Thank you, President Wolf. I wanted to make a quick comment because I know we're going to spend some more well deserved time on this topic when it comes back in February. But I did want to say the pivotal part of your question is, was read, and Dr. Nixon and I go back with these articles all the time, trying to study who is representing our workforce right now. That's Gen Z, ages 6 to 24, and millennials, okay, ages 24, 25 to 40, and then beyond, and then some of us. Um, <laughs> don't fit into another category. But the first part is us just constantly looking as we continue to onboard our staff, knowing who fits into each of those areas, because there's so much research that has actually come out from COVID-19 saying how these young people, our future workforce, are envisioning what's important to them, and that's contributing to them coming. And the lifespan of a focus for a millennial, I believe, is two years and eight months. We know we need them much longer than that. We also know that we need them in critical areas. And one big component that I look forward to us continue to talk about is how do we make the workplace not just a space for them to come and work, but to feel like it is addressing their mental health needs, that they don't have to go somewhere else to do that, and it's the day to day. And we've got to look at this broadly from a system because that type of culture has to exist in the schools and in every single office that we have. So that looks very different. Very different from when you even think about our offices and how they're set up and the things that we've done in or not done yet in our environments to make it be a place that says we're focused on you as an individual in addition to the contributions that you make to the work that you bring. So this, this is a conversation that I can imagine we will, will be continued over time um, and how do we get there because we do need uh, these young people to come in and want to continue to be a part of the workforce. And we represent one of the largest, the largest uh, employer within the county. So we've got to know that and figure that out and should continue to say what are the investments needed to create that type of environment and culture. Thank you. I have a follow up. You know, I've long been concerned about retention. Mm -hmm. And I do know that you do exit interviews and while I do accept that millennials and those generations don't stay around very long, I, I do notice, though, that with minority candidates, they leave. And so I know that we're doing the anti-racist audit in hopes of trying to make some determination, but I'd like the exit interviews analyzed to see if you're seeing a pattern about what people are saying, if they're even being honest with you. And I was also hoping, even with the generation X and Y or whatever number we're, whatever letter we're on right now, if you could break that down by race when they leave. Okay. Certainly. So I'm hoping. You, I don't know how much data you have because COVID, you know, may have interfered. So maybe you could give me over a three-year period of time. Certainly. You're seeing. Absolutely, Dr. Wolf. Thank you. Thank you, yep. Ms. Mandrowski. Yeah, I'll be quick. Um, I really appreciate all the work that you're doing to try and restructure and revamp and <laughs> human resources department and all the work that you're doing. I know it hasn't been easy and it's a lot. Um, I'm very ex happy to see that we are, that there's room in the budget for additional staffing for your office. Um, the one thing that I would um, like to to put out there. I don't know how readily available people are to answer, to take phone calls and things like that for people. Um, I know we're going to be talking about it in February, so I'll talk more about it, but I had actually three individual people come to me over the weekend about the fact that they were struggling to, and they want to go to the job fair because they just want to talk to somebody in person. <laughs> They're like, we just can't navigate the system. And it occurred to me, you know, um, I don't know how often we go on, but especially as we're making changes, how often we internally go on and actually 
try to be like an applicant. Like one one of the people that um, I spoke to, she's currently a para educator somewhere, and she was applying. To, she wanted to look at other schools, and she kept coming back that she wasn't qualified to be a para educator. She's like, I'm already a para educator. <laughs> so there's like confusion areas. I think that. Um, if we have, you know, people that you can call that can offer support for the online tech support, maybe or yeah. something like that, might be something that even just helps people get through the the process. But I'm very happy to hear you're having a, a job fair coming up as well. So February third and fourth. Yeah, that's awesome. So I, I suspect there will be a decent number of people yeah. there, hopefully. But um, yeah. So thank you. I um, I appreciate the work you're doing to try and make this better for all of our employees. Miss Silvestri. I want to echo um, every chance I get to thank you and your team for the incredible effort that you have had to undertake always, but especially in the last two years with our constant hiring and recruiting and monitors and staffing shortages. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you for everything that you do. Um, it's a $37,000 change. so. <laughs> It's hardly anything, really, uh, in a budget of billions. Uh, did we add positions last year? Yes. At the end of last year, um, there were positions added, and um, those positions were to support our recruitment team and our certification team and our Grow Your Own programs. So those were uh, in support of uh, certification and staffing and then a position in onboarding and induction so that we could begin to um, expand the way in which we onboard individuals. Uh, and you may recall in the November meeting, one of the things that Dr. Stanislaus talked about was in, in a lot of the HR research, what we were finding is that you know, a, a three-day orientation was not enough to help someone feel acclimated into the organization. And so we wanted to have our new employees have a year-long experience so that they would continually have touch points throughout the, the course of the year. And so, um, so those positions were added um, in the late spring, and they were in support of the reimagination. Great. Thank you. So I, I always I ask that question because I'm always concerned, do we have enough people and resources in place to meet our expectations. I mean, we want to start the school year next year as fully staffed as possible. We're always a little short staffed in, in, in everything, but uh, you know, nothing like we have today. Yet, who knows what the future holds? Will the staffing shortages continue nationwide? And so all that to say is that we're expecting HR to walk on water to do better than every other HR system in, in the area, to hire, to be fully staffed, uh, to uh, you know launch this Grow Your Own program that I'm very excited about. So um, what do you think it's going to take for us to open our schools, well, finish out the school year, but as we project for the future, what's it going to take for our system to be as fully staffed as possible come August? So that's a big question, Ms. Silvestri. So uh, first, we start with our strategic recruitment and the fact that um, with the, the board's support and Dr. McKnight's support, we have two full-time recruiters who um, spend every day either on the road or on a virtual platform interviewing, vetting, and screening candidates, offering open contracts. We know that the investment in that is a way to make sure that we have teachers in the pipeline ready to go through the open contract process. Um, and as we move closer to the spring, the, the job fairs will become more frequent. And we hope to see movement on the open contract front and, of course, on traffic on our, on our website for people applying to positions. Uh, we work very closely with uh, all of our staffing assistants, work very closely with their principal partners at the school site, where they uh, accurately make some predictions about where are you seeing some potential vacancies. So, so a good bit of it is being very proactive in the conversations that our staffers are having with the principals to see where we might have retirements, where people may have already said, I'm moving away, uh, knowing where those vacancies are going to be as quickly as possible. 
Um, and I think the other, the other piece too is working closely with our directors and our associates in OTLS, where we see schools and the staffing and where we might have um, opportunity to, to pull staffing to, to place in other schools because we know at the end of last year with the unpredictability of where we would land and where things would be, we did not pull staffing um, at the end of last year. So looking at some of those practices, anticipating where the vacancies are, getting those open contracts out, hiring early, we've adjusted our staffing cal calendar. We had great meetings with all of our um, union presidents. Uh, Ms. Edwards helped to facilitate a lot of that, Mr. Wiebe in certification and staffing, to look at um, how that calendar needs to work for us and in our favor, most especially so our high impact schools, Title I schools have access to open contracts first. So there are things that we've already been doing very proactively to make sure that we are ready uh, for for fall opening. And, you know, working with our university partners is also very critical because oftentimes they will come to us and ask us what can we do to help get people enrolled in our teacher prep programs? How can we have access to your students? So the Grow Your Own, the pipeline, the, um, the presentation that you will hear updates on in February, those are very future forward thinking endeavors, and I know what you're talking about is right now. And so we remain as competitive as we can be. Uh, we're working with Miss uh, uh, Jeannie Banky in, uh, with the, the blueprint, which I know you'll be hearing more about the blueprint. So our compliance with the blueprint to make sure that our salaries um, are meeting the, the recommendations of that, the investment the, that we are making in NBCT, all of those things are very attractive features. And I think we'll make coming to Maryland, coming to Montgomery County. Um, I think those are all part of what I'd call like a, a great marketing strategy too. So it's, it's, it's all of that and it's being out there. It's being forward, front facing. This is a great place to work. We have an amazing benefits package. We, you know, when you're 21 or 22, you might not be so crazy about your retirement. You're not thinking about it necessarily. But it is something that we talk to folks about when, when you know, they're on the road because it's not just the starting salary. It's a comprehensive benefits package that has value as well. So we know we use that as part of our marketing. Our tuition reimbursement is, is, a, is a big selling point as well. And I think when we're able to talk to folks about you really can build a career here. And we have videos that we share and we have testimonials that we share where people can really see where individuals have really grown careers. So I, I think it's all of that. The, the team does a tremendous job. Um, and I think cultivating these partnerships with the universities, with organizations, when we talk about everyone being an ambassador for MCPS, I cannot underscore that enough. Uh, and I cannot thank, uh, many of you will say, hey, uh, I know this person is moving from Ohio. This person is moving from Nevada. Keep sending those to me. Um, and, and additionally, we have teachers, uh, teachers um, in our ranks who uh, will email me and say, my sister-in-law is relocating from New Mexico. So it really, it does take the village, uh, so to speak, where we're all ambassadors, we're all looking for great talent. And it's most helpful when everyone is saying, or, you know, helping us to get the message out that we are hiring, that we hire for all positions, that you can build a career here, um, and we can help you get to where you want to go. And we are, we do have an infrastructure in place and a leadership and a vision in place to help people see us as not only a viable employer, but a destination employer. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nixon. I, I truly hope that uh, all of this pans out so that we're fully staffed come August. Two quick questions um, for the February 8th presentation. Will career pathways include principals? Yes, we're, we're going, yes, thank you. We're going to have an update for you on cohort inspire. Yes, and that's the leadership in the high impact schools. And just a follow up from last, our last board meeting, Ms. Majowski asked or, or suggested that we come up with a pay differential for employees that are using their bilingual skills. And I think you sent us, yes. sent me, and, and I forwarded it to her an update that that pay differential exists for Correct. SEIU members. Correct. It does My exist. My 
question is, did it used to be for all staff previously, or has it only ever been for SEIU members? So my understanding is it has been for SEIU, but if there's a historical perspective that, is, is that correct? SEIU, yes. Okay. Uh, and I did provide, Ms. Sylvester, you had asked for the list of, um, by office, the language is spoken, so I do, I do have that as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not seeing any other lights. Ms. Ohlone? Yes, I just had a quick question. Um, I see that there's almost $4 million here for tuition reimbursement, um, but especially for our Grow Your Own program, if we're, if we're thinking about growing that, um, many times our students don't even have the money to be able to put, that, the, tu put the tuition up, up front for it to be reimbursed. Um, so is there, have we thought about being able to pay it up front instead of doing a reimbursement structure? So that's, yes. So what you're referring to is an opportunity to have seed money so that perhaps we could help to provide scholarships for our students to go to a university and come back to us. So um, Mr. Wiebe, are you, are you there? Because I just wanted to share that Mr. Wiebe has had um, He's been in, in, in contact with some of our higher ed partners to look at just what you're talking about. Is that the university partnership tuition that's 0.35 million? No. That's separate. Okay. That's separate. Good afternoon, everyone. And, and again, thank you, Dr. Nixon. And um, yes, so a few different conversations that are ongoing uh, related to the Grow Your Own project and with, uh, as Dr. Nixon alluded to, some of our higher ed partnerships that already are in existence. So we're having some of those conversations because the philosophy, of course, from the MCPS perspective is we want to provide a pathway with no barriers for our students to return to MCPS. And there's a really a multi-pronged um, opportunity for that. And so we know already that some of our students are enrolled in the Teacher Academy of Maryland program, as well as some students who are already enrolled in the dual um, dual enrollment program with Montgomery College, which of course lends itself to um, coming out with the Associate of Arts in Teaching with an even quicker return uh, rate when they are able to, to go to a university or a college within Maryland to complete that degree. Some of the things that we're also thinking of and that we'll preview um, for you here, and of course we'll talk more about um, in depth during our February 8th presentation, is the idea of if you are pursuing perhaps that Associate of Arts and Teaching degree at Montgomery College, might you also be able to be um, a, an employee here within MCPS? As we described, there are multiple and varied opportunities for um, our students. Paraeducators is obviously an area that we are um, in need for. And could that then connect back to the tuition reimbursement that Dr. Nixon was referring to? So we are exploring a, a multiple and varied um, opportunities and pathways for students, but certainly um, the goal is to make sure that there are no financial or other barriers that would prevent someone from pursuing a degree that would ultimately lead them to return to an MCPS classroom. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. We're now up to chapter 11. Good afternoon, Ms. Wolf, members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to present information about chapter 11 in the interim superintendent's fiscal year 2023 recommended operating budget. This slide represents the funds budgeted for all offices in chapter 11, administration and oversight, including the Board of Education and Internal Audit Unit, Office of the Superintendent, Office of the Chief of Staff, Office of Shared Accountability, Department of Communications, Department of Systemwide Safety and Emergency Management, and Office of the General Counsel. I want to take a moment to highlight some of the numbers contained on this slide. The Instructional TV Special Revenue Fund comes from the Montgomery County Cable TV Fund as part of the County Cable Television Plan. The county provides MCPS funding to supplement our MCPS television department. The funding supports 13.5 positions and has a budget of $1.8 million, reflected on this slide as $1.3 million under salaries and wages, number one, $100,000 under supplies and materials, number three, and $400,000 for benefits under number four. I also want to share details about some of the contractual services. Security services of a million dollars includes funds for fingerprinting services and expenditures to implement various security services and technologies across the district. 
Legal services of $700,000 includes funds for outside legal counsel services. Communication services of $600,000 includes funds for EpiServer, the district web content management system, our language line for interpretation service, and other community engagement services. The assessment fee coverage of $400,000 includes funds to cover the cost of the SAT and other college and career assessment fees. Next slide, please. I would now like to take a moment to address some of the realignments in this chapter, starting with in the internal audit unit. Funds within this unit are realigned to create a 0.5 internal audit analyst position to provide better support to schools and offices around audits of school independent activity funds, general financial challenges, and staff training. In the office of the general counsel, funds within this unit are realigned to create a 0.2 assistant general counsel position, which is added to an existing 0.8 assistant general counsel position, bringing the position to a 1.0 FTE. Bringing this position to a full-time position will allow for greater in-house support in handling MCPS legal matters. In the Department of Communications, there is a 1.0 public information supervisor position being realigned to create a 1.0 director position to allow for better oversight and support for the communications team required as a result of the continually expanding efforts to provide engagement with MCPS staff, students, and community. As a result of these realignments, $13,000 is realigned from Chapter 11 to Chapter 9, Finance, for employee benefits. Next slide, please. Finally, I want to take a moment to address two rate changes in this chapter. In the Office of the General Counsel, an increase of $63,500 for legal services, and then the Department of Communication, an increase of almost $30,000 for EpiServer, as noted, the District Web Content Management System. Thank you very much. I will now turn the presentation back to you, Ms. Wolf. Thank you. Please turn your light on if you have any questions, Ms. Harris. Yeah, I just have a quick one, Mr. D'Angelo. Um, on uh, the first slide, I think, under contractual services, you, one of the things you mentioned under the security services was fingerprinting. Um, can you, is that just paying people that, that operate our fingerprinting processing, or is that providing funding to um, pave the way for new employees so that we are just covering those costs? We do not currently cover the cost of the fingerprinting for our new employees. Um, so that is part of the overall paying the staff who work there. So this is just that we make it, we have an office available for new prospective employees to come to to get fingerprinted if they want to do it there instead of going elsewhere. Yes, that is correct. Okay, okay. thank you. Ms. Silvestri. I have a process question. I may have missed it, but have we received our um, follow-up? We ask questions that are all, at all these work sessions, and some of them are follow-ups. Have we received those, or when can we expect to receive them? Um, we're in the process of finishing up from the 10th and the 11th. I think there's only one or two questions left, and then we'll be working on the ones from the 18th and 19th uh, right now. So. Um, they will be forthcoming as soon yeah. as possible. If you could send what you have, that way we, we don't have to wait till the end to get yeah. all that. Thank you. I just have one brief question myself. The uh, in rate increase of 63500 for legal is such a precise number. I wanted to know what that represented. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. I will ask um, Ms. Williams to chime in on that. Yeah, Ms. Wolf, is this working? Am I on? Okay, thank you. So um, estimating legal fees is never an, an exact science, um, but the firms that we worked with did not increase their rates um, prior year. So we have had in rate increases for each of the law firms that, we've worked, that we have contractual arrangements with, and then we sort of extrapolated those increased fees over our typical um, expenditures. And so you think the $63,500 is enough? Of an inc and in not, it, that's not our total, that's not our total budget. It's an increase over the, over the right. prior years. But your budget is only 700,000? Uh, that's right. And last year we, we exceeded that amount. Um, but in consultation with the budget office, we thought that we would make a, a, a more gradual um, increase in the budget for these fees um, based on the fees that, the increases that we receive from the law firms. 
Okay, I just knew that you spent more than that last year. I was trying to figure out how you came up with 63500 being sufficient. Thank you. Dr. Joftis. Uh, thank you, Ms. Wolf. <clears throat> Ms. Wolf. Um, we've talked a little bit, um, Jimmy, about uh, the need for some crisis communications, especially as it relates to COVID and now, the, you know, the tragic shootings and so forth. I'm wondering if, if any thought has been given uh, to, to, that, to that area. There's definitely been a lot of um, consideration of that. This information here is part of our same services initial right. recommended operating budget proposal from the interim superintendent. We anticipate coming back um, with amendments uh, to the board in uh, February. Yes, and thank you for that. Um, Dr. Joftis, we appreciate that question. Another place in which we will see um, some of the planning for that would come forward in a consent item in which we will discuss even in more depth about what that item would serve in terms of the purposes of crisis communication and quite frankly, um, just generally overall communications need that we all have seen have been derived from the experiences in COVID-19. So that'll be another opportunity for us to discuss that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Madrowski. So just to clarify, because that was really my question as well. That is something we'll be talking about when we meet again in February, communications, I mean, in general. Um, and you know, like even things like uh, communications from our office and, and stuff like that is, th yes. these are all things that will be discussed at the next budget work session. Yes, uh, we're going to bring the next budget session, the purpose of it was to not only address all these different streams of funding and how we're using all of the finances, but it's also an opportunity for us as a system and you as the board to come forward and say, based on all of these discussions, the hearings, what are additional things that we see are beyond what we see as needs for the same services budget. So that will be an opportunity for us to really talk about that and some of the, um, I guess, how we all see what those priorities are that we wanna have as a placeholder in our operating budget before we move it forward to county council. Um, so that's a part of what I look forward to us discussion, discussing after we've had a chance to process all of this information and hear from our stakeholders around how they see those priorities. That's, that's, a, that's one part of it. The other part of us bringing the other streams of funding back is we'll also be able to see it from a bigger picture. We've been talking about operating budget for the last couple of weeks, but we also wanna see how some of these things have been provisioned for in some of these other funding streams so that then we can all feel very confident about where we wanna have specific line, line items in our operating budget. Um, in some cases, yes, that may be funded in other areas, but to at least signal that we see this as an important part of the foundation for the system now and in the future, no matter what. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. At this time, I'm not seeing oh, Ms. Silvestri. Uh, we received an email from staff that today we were to voice our issues that we would like to possibly be considered at the next budget work session. Is that the case or should we hold them until the next work session? We're gonna start to have some conversations today, just kind of reflection of what we've heard. I think that's absolutely appropriate. I would recommend that for our next meeting, we wanna come back with some formed recommendations based on just maybe some discussion that we have today um, and prioritize based on that so that the staff can hear that and be able to have time to make any adjustments necessary to finalize what we then send forward to the county council. So I'll leave that to Ms. Wolf. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so um, I recognize that our budget request is a large one already because we're trying to give our, our, our hardworking staff much, much deserved uh, pay increases. And therefore, I'm trying to be very disciplined and very strategic about the following, given that, uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that I would love to have included, but I'm trying to be disciplined, recognizing that it's going to be a big ask just to get our, our salary increases passed. So the things that I have heard uh, repeatedly throughout either public testimony or emails to the board are around um, communications. And so we've already touched on that and there's something coming uh, from, from your office. But I also think that the Board of Education needs a communications person. Right. 
uh, part of our job is community engagement. And there's a lot of expectations in the community about our interactions with the public. I would love to do a lot of things on social media. I would love to do things streaming. I would love to do a newsletter. I can't do it on my own time. And the, the, the board staff also is uh, pretty uh, maxed out in their responsibilities. So um, that is something that I, I have been talking about with my colleagues for several years now. And I think, um, I think it's important that we consider that. Um, and then just uh, as of recently, because of the recent events, um, you know, I would love to have a recommendation from our safety and security team in terms of what enhancements we can make uh, immediately and in the budget for next year. Um, I'm, this is not a priority, but I want you to know that uh, some things that uh, resonated with me in testimony was additional support for all of our wonderful novice principals. Uh, you know that's near and dear to my heart in terms of placing our principals in highly impacted schools and giving them all the resources. Um, that's a, there's the immediate, and then there are the things that resonated to me that I said, oh, gosh, I sure wish we could support them more because that's such an important reform effort in our school system. Um, and so I'll stop there. Thank you. Ms. Mandrowski. Yeah, thank you. To uh, Ms. Sylvester's point and to what I was saying before, you know, I. I I do know that there are a lot of um, things that we need and frequently we don't um, like to put too much into uh, additional resources into our office specifically, but for us to have our own communication um, person, I do think would be critical. I think it's something that we've all heard over and over again. And, um, and there's just, there's a lot of opportunity for, um, for us to be supported in different ways like um, newsletters and, and things like that, social media stuff that we can't currently do now. Um, so I just kind of want to reemphasize that I too would consider that a priority in terms of what you would look at for the next work session. Um, and then she already mentioned security, so that kind of stuff too. Ms. Harris. Yes, thank you. Um, this comes from, um, I think, building on a conversation that you and I had, Dr. McKnight, uh, over a week ago, so, or maybe a week ago, so preceding the events at Magruder last Friday. Um, but um, I would like to see us think about, since we've seen the, and, and just lately we've seen the very positive work that the county's um, positive youth development team and Street Outreach Network does. Mm -hmm. Looking at, and I've been also reviewing the recommendations from last winter's um, Reimagining Public Safety Task Force and its applications to schools. Um, at perhaps as we've created a newcomer position, newcomer coordinator position, possibly think about creating a separate position that is a, a positive youth development position to liaise directly with the county's uh, pos you know, positive youth development team so we could be working together um, more comprehensively on the ground and community. And also possibly think about providing the, um, and I'm gonna make sure, I'm gonna get this exactly right, the Professional Community Intervention Training Institute training, which is something that the Positive Youth Development Team and the Street Outreach Network team at the county take. And it's all about, um, creating the resources for community um, and to strengthen community. And it's um, uh, reading the reviews of, com of communities and different kinds of stakeholders from all over the country that have taken the training. It seems like it's incredibly well done and could add a lot of value to our work, even if we are only able to send a few people from this department and the department and the other department to the training. Um, so if we could possibly take a look at the, that training specifically, the costs, and would there be a possibility, even maybe even to find a grant to help us bring some of that training? Um, yeah, thank you. I would like to say these are all great ideas, and I really do appreciate the thought, and I do believe a crisis communication person is absolutely necessary. My concern is what's going on in our school buildings. And what I wanted to know, just because I'm not sure I got a clear answer, 
is what are we doing to help our counselors that are dealing with these 504 forms and things that they have. I mean, we need to get them some help, mm -hmm. some support, so that they can do their work around counseling our students. So that is my ask. What is it we're doing for them? Mm -hmm. Because they are the boots on the ground, and that's what's important to me. Good point. Okay. Good point. All right, Ms. Madrowski. I just have a quick question. Um, uh, it, in terms of human resources, sorry to go back a second, but um, our substitutes, I feel like you touched on this um, at a previous meeting, but I'm, I just can't really remember specifically, but do our substitutes have the ability to sign up in a way that would enable them to get benefits? They do not. Is that something that we could look at, like a, in terms of a if they applied to be a? I, I thought we talked about the idea that, um, but this might have been an actually. Now that I'm thinking about it, an idea I heard from somebody else, um, where they would uh, sign up to be a substitute uh, as a full-time substitute and go anywhere that you assign them, and then they would also get health benefits and, and all of our benefits. So I, in terms of a benefits question, I'd have to defer to the benefits office, but I will say this, it's, it's a very timely question that you ask because this morning I did receive a, a report from an organization, like a, a, an education think tank, where they were enumerating the states that have already determined that they were going to make benefits available to their subs because they've done that as a recruiting strategy. So I think that's, I mean, you know, I, I couldn't even begin to, to imagine what, what the cost of all of that would be, but that's certainly something that we can, I, you know, I would definitely have the conversation with my colleagues. Yeah. We could get some sort of estimate on something like that. I do think it's something that could really be an attractive um, aspect. And, right. you and know, obviously there would be um, specific things that they would have to right. follow, you know, guidelines or whatever, but I do feel like it could be a really good and, opportunity. And, and just along those lines, we are also looking at opportunities for professional development. Because one of the things that, that we have learned through our My Mag advisory with principals, leaders from central office and, and the school, is that one of their retention strategies is really again, it's about relationships. It's about making certain that that substitute teacher or that guest teacher, right? The guest teacher in your building for that day feels like he or she is part of this community. And part of that is um, if they are someone that does not have a teaching in their background, but they realize they have an interest in it, this is something that they could possibly do, in what ways can we leverage some professional development opportunities so that that perhaps even becomes a pathway or you know, an entry point for future teachers through this substitute teacher pathway, if you will. So that's definitely something that, that we're looking at in terms of, you know, fortifying that program and, and really leveraging the people that are coming to us with an interest to be in our schools and to be in a classroom. Okay, thank you. Ms. Harris. Yeah, I'm sorry. One other thing I wrote down and missed. Um, one other thing that um, came out of the um, Reimagining Public Safety Report was the recommendation that um, MCPS do um, universal beginning and end of years kind of student safety surveys that are well designed to allow students to be very frank and honest and, a, and confidential about sharing um, their perspectives on their needs and their perceptions about um, their schools being um, safe and welcoming spaces. And it, part of the purpose, it said in the report, was to, uh, as a mechanism for reducing stigma it was for students who might seek out services in their school or through the community, but also to help us better scope out the need for those services. And I don't, I don't think we have looked to um, operationalizing that recommendation. Maybe we have. But um, to me, it seems like it could be very, very useful to the work that we are trying to do, especially with OSFSC. Um, so, just putting that out there. Okay, Ms. O'Looney. Yeah, I know I already spoke to this once uh, prior today, but just to 
reinforce again, uh, now that we've come to the end of our discussion here, um, I think one of the biggest changes coming to the day-to-day -day lives of our students for this next school year that we're planning for is the fact that lunches are no longer going to be free. Um, and I know it's not likely plausible for us to be able to continue funding that and absorbing that cost for the whole district. But even if we could just um, provide free meals for our Title I schools, um, just making sure that we're providing that comfort where we can, I think just seeing that cost would be really helpful um, if you could bring that back to a work session. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any other lights. I just have one thought I wanted to know if you've ever considered Dr. Dixon. Dixon, Nixon, I'm sorry, yeah. Helen. You know, I call you Helen and then I have to remember your last name. Um, you know, we're talking about Grow Your Own, which is excellent because those kids are in the county and they already have a place to live. But when you're trying to recruit, Montgomery County is a very expensive place to bring people to. I'm thinking that maybe we need to start thinking about trying to work with the county council. This comes up every year. I mean, this is nothing new. Yeah. Work with the county council about some sort of housing relief for people that are willing to come and work in the county because their salaries are going to put them over the MDPU limits. So, I mean, we, we have no choice but to try to work with, with them to get some assistance here. Or tax break. Yeah. yeah, well, a tax break, according to a lot of them, isn't that helpful. Yeah. They said they need the money, you know, to, to put down. The other thing I, I wanted to ask you, just for your consideration, not to discuss, you know, okay, the Grow Your Own, like I said, they live here, but Howard, Bowie, places where you can get a lot of uh, minority teachers and they have schools of education, those kids don't have a way to get to a school here because none of our schools or the majority of them are not on a transportation line. And most college kids don't have a car. Is there anything that you can start thinking about around that? And you don't have to answer that now because I've raised that issue before too. If I may make two quick comments. So earlier in the year, Dr. McKnight appointed me to work Source Montgomery. So I, I sit on the board of that. And this morning I actually had a meeting with a gentleman who is a regional director for the county council. And um, I'm also the chair of workforce recovery for this committee. And so it was a great meeting for me this morning because I'm getting to, to, to know folks that, that sit in these kinds of positions. And we had this really great con a starter conversation. It was just a, a, a basic introduction conversation, but it really was about making Montgomery County uh, an attractive place to work and, and any opportunities where we can partner with the county council uh, to do that. And so we started that conversation this morning and thinking about other, other pathways from county positions uh, you know, into MCPS positions and, and what those pathways could possibly be. So I'm very excited to be part of that work. I've, I've been to two meetings so far, but I just wanted to let the, the, the team and the board know that I will be invested in, in doing that work as the chair of workforce recovery. And then to the other point, yes, um, I want to give credit to Ms. Edwards for a couple of years ago um, providing bus buses, bus transportation for Bowie students to be able to do their student teaching here. We had a very similar program in Howard County as well. So that is something that we can do when we identify what those barriers might be to getting student teachers here. That is certainly an option that we can um, look at. And then I don't, d depending on the cooperating university, if they would allow for a virtual teaching experience. So there are a lot of different ways where we can start looking at the ways in which our student teachers can access a student teaching experience. Um, but if transportation, which is also one perhaps of the barriers from our Howard University uh, is one of the aspects that we heard too, but, but we are working on that and, and, and what can we do to take those challenges out of the way um, and that could be it. And along with making sure that we open contract these students um, as, as we get to see them and meet them. And in February, we're going to showcase one of our um, recruiting events at Howard and the students that we met when we were there. Well, thank you, because I've seen transportation and housing as our two biggest deterrents to actually yes. being able to even diversify the workforce if you don't already live in the county. Ms. Thank Wolf, you. if I may, and I know we said, that I can't wait until February until we get this presentation. <laughs> we can, 
But what Dr. Nixon said is absolutely right. Um, we've spoken with the county government to say this has to be a county initiative and we can't do it by ourselves. And they are, I, I'm happy to say that they've been very supportive of that and have been able to lend those partnerships. This got to the question you were asking Ms. Sylvester earlier about what else do human resources need? This is a perfect example of it's not all going to come through looking like staffing support in the Office of Human Resources because we already knew. We visited Bowie State the very year that we went into, actually it was maybe the month before we went into the pandemic. And we heard, I was there, the student said, we can't get to Montgomery County. And if we do get to Montgomery County, we can only get to certain schools. Therefore, we're not using the breadth of their diversity in the county in the way that we need to. So um, we had already said at that meet, yes, so this is going to be, transportation is going to be a part of the initiative, although it does not fall under human resources, it falls in a whole nother department, but it supports this, this actual work that we're talking about. So the, the reimagining of the work of this office really is going to expand across all different departments, as it should. Um, and so as we continue to talk through this, we will make an, we will highlight how it may support a different initiative, but is in a separate office. Um, so, thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. McKnight. And I want to thank the team for all your hard work today, because I know it was pretty hard to sit there and take question after question, but you all did a great job. So thank you. Uh, and I think we're adjourned for today. Can I get a motion to adjourn? I don't know. I don't even think we need one. We don't need one, no. All right, we're adjourned.